This is a recording of the September 25th meeting of the Coast Division of the NMRA, featuring a soldering demonstration by David Gibbons. So hi, this is Phil Edholm. Welcome. Um, this is our Coast Division uh, meet, and I'm going to go ahead and talk a little bit about our agenda for this evening, or this morning, sorry. Uh, so very quickly, uh, first, we're going to have a couple of updates. Um, next virtual events, the convention. Um, I'm at, I'm, we're going to talk a little bit about our trip that's coming up in a few weeks. And Frank's going to talk a little bit about um, the uh, board meeting and conventions going forward. Uh, we're going to then jump into bring what you're modeling. And so if you're interested in showing something you've modeled or have something interesting to show, we'll do that next. And then we're going to jump into, I think, something really great, which is soldering electrical components. So David did a clinic earlier on how to build a turnout using fast tracks and how to solder those well. Uh, he's at, coming back to focus on soldering electrical components, circuit boards, those kinds of things. Um, so very quickly, um, we have our trip planned in, uh, I guess it's what, three weeks now? Um, the, on October 16th. Um, we will be going to the California State Railroad Museum. Um, my assumption at this point is that both Amtrak and um, the Railroad Museum will require masks. So except for the time you're outside or decide to go to eat, um, it's going to be reasonably, reasonably protected. And um, so we actually have a um, the trip planned on a specific train. It's train... 724. Um, that leaves San Jose, I think, at 805 and arrives in Sacramento at 1110. Um, if you're in the North Bay, you can join in Martinez. It uh, goes all the way up through the Bay. I think you can join at the Coliseum as well if you want to take BART. Um, the mission for the, the train, by the way, it depends on where you join it. It's about $40 round trip from Martinez, and I think it's $60 to $80 round trip farther south. So um, that's, and that's something just to do on your own. The return trip, by the way, if you decide you want to have dinner up there, there's a later train right around 7-ish. Um, if you decide you want to come home earlier, there's an earlier 5 o'clock return train. Um, it's $12 to, to enter the museum. and. Um, Charlie Getz um, will be doing a tour of the NMRA museum exhibit um, at noon on, um, on the, during the, the tour. Um, and it's a great opportunity because, you know, he was intimately involved in curating the materials, the model railroad items in that exhibit. And I think it'd be great to hear stories about some of those things, where they came from and how they came to be in the exhibit. So anyway, everyone's encouraged to come. Um, and any, any comments about the trip or. Yeah, what? I, I just want to uh, add that, um, Amtrak is having a sale right now and there's a 30% off. Now that's if you're under 65. So, uh, there's, I think a, a greater discount if you're over 65. So we can't claim discrimination. Oh, dang it. Huh? How do you take we advantage of that? Ken, yeah, that, how do you I, take advantage of that? How do you take advantage of that? Okay, do you uh, go to the Groups OIO um, thing? Either that or just go to the, the, the Capitol Corridor uh, website and, and, and the order there. I mean, I put the URL in, in the message on the Groups.io uh, PCR um, uh, message. Uh, but the... Um, the, it, it just contains really a, a, a reference to the um, uh, Capitol uh, Corridor yep. website, which is the Amtrak uh, site for, for ordering any of uh, the tickets for. Yeah, I, I actually, I think you can get them on the Amtrak site. If you search the Amtrak yeah. site for wherever you are to Sacramento. It'll come back with options. So if you can do Martinez to Sacramento on Amtrak, it'll also include the Zephyr. Um, but we chose the, the Capitol Corridor because it goes all the way to San Jose. The Zephyr starts in Emeryville. And that really wasn't fair to the, everybody in the South Bay. 
Um, by the way, the, the one thing, and we'll I, talk about this next in two weeks, because that'll be, a, I think, a week before we go, because it's three weeks from now. Uh, one thing we'd, I'd like to figure out is some sort of a jungle telegraph um, for folks who are at different stations so we can identify which car we're going to be in. Or there was a suggestion that we just all take the first car after the engine and load into that car, and that way we'll all be in one location. Um, but that's something I... Uh, of course, on the other hand, if you know we're all in the first car and you'd like to avoid us, that tells you you should stay somewhere else on the train. Um, I just needed to add one thing. The, Am uh, the Capital Corridor uh, Amtrak uh, trains, they have um, uh, basically said that you can buy this ticket now at the 30% reduction. And it's, it, it's an open return. I mean, you can come, you know, you back uh, from Sacramento up to six months or something like that. Wow. So um, they, they've really changed and liberalized the terms of the whole thing. Uh, I put the, some of the details on, on that posting on, on groups.io, but it refers you to the website, which has all of these details. I mean, it's really a great deal. And by the way, the open return applies to seniors. Well, that'll be uh, that'll be the way to go that I, that I would pursue myself. But my question before you you mentioned that, Ken, uh, typically uh, does Amtrak do you pay on board? Uh, can, is there vending machines at the station for no. tickets? Or? No, you have to buy at a station if you do not buy. Um, uh, at the uh, on the web and have it in advance. A station but, agent or machine? Huh? Station agent or a ticket machine? Uh, uh, depends on the station. A Cossack. In Berkeley, there's a ticket machine. Well, it depends. Martinez has an agent. Uh, Emeryville ha uh, has an agent. Oakland has an agent. But some of the smaller stations along the line don't. They have a ticket machine. And those ones that have an agent may also have a machine, just like yeah. they do at BART, where they have the machines, but there is an agent there if you can't figure out how to make it, the machines work. They probably do just for times when there's no one in the office. Yeah. I, I, I mean, buying it online is pretty easy. And I think you just yeah. print out your ticket and take it with you or take it on your phone. Just show up and tell, tell them if they uh, accost you that Phil said it was free to all PCR members. <laughs> there you go. Blame me. That's it. It's good. Works well. I also put some comments on, on the website about the um, ADA access at Sacramento. Um, if there's anybody who has would have trouble walking a distance, you will need will will notify the customer uh, the, the conductor in advance and make sure that they uh, meet the train with uh, a little. Um, golf cart type thing for mobility to take you in as far as the um, uh, the station building. Um, I put a, a, a the, they've totally rebuilt the, 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 Amtra, the passenger service, tra rail tracks, everything in Sacramento. And it's, it's a, about a, you know, two tenths of a mile walk from the tracks to actually get to the station building. Yeah. And you go through a subway and then come back up uh, uh, to a covered uh, por portico that takes you into the, the old Sacramento yeah. station. I uh, mean, to, to make mm -hmm. sure what Ken says, it's a, it is a bit of a hike from yeah. the train station to the museum. And so one of the thoughts was, there's, there's two things. You can have someone, they, you can be met at the train and they'll take you basically to the front parking lot. And if there are members who would like to, um, you know, we can do this on groups.io or we can talk about it next Saturday. Um, if there are two or three members, get, let's get together and get a, ta get a cab or an Uber from there over to the museum. It's not that far. It's only probably what, it's not even a half a mile. I think it's probably a quarter of a mile once you get there. But it's, you know, it may be that, that there are a few folks that want to do that. So, yeah, but, but the, the, the fact is that you will have to will have to notify the conductor before we get to Sacramento 
to make sure that there's going to be the go kart there to to take you through to the well, station. Is there anyone on now who feels they would want that if, if they're they're just planning on going and would want that? Because then we'll just make sure we notify the conductor for sure. So if we have one member that wants it, we'll notify him. And then if anybody else wants to use it, they can. So. I mean, if everybody's comfortable walking, then we'll just do the walk. Because if we do it together, it's not, it's, the, the only thing is getting it. There's one road you have to kind of cut across to get through there, but there's no real traffic on it. So it's really pretty reasonable. Could I have a sound check, please? You sound great. Okay. I just wanted so, to make sure I, I, I'm back up. It appears I'm back up now. You know, I'm going to make a suggestion. So I think we're, we kind of got a great review on that. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I think it's going to be, I feel very comfortable. It's going to be very safe because of being on in the museum and on the train. So um, I'm very comfortable and I think it's a great time to do it. Uh, the last update, um, we had a meeting of the auction committee, um, including Bob and Craig, as many of you know, Bob, um, has expressed an interest um, because of both health and just longevity in the role of backing out of the back office role in the auction. Um, Jer Ingram has stepped forward to take on that. We had a group meeting, we went through it and we are planning and we've, I have an identified date. I'm not ready to announce yet because we have not confirmed with the Elks, but our goal is to have a meeting in March um, at the Elks where we will accommodate the first auction we've had for a while and it'll probably be a bit more of an auction focused meeting because our assumption is that'll be a reasonably large auction um, so just a, a quick update on that and let me throw it to Frank Frank um, talk about the board meeting and PCR and, and conventions hi everybody uh, turning my camera on for a minute our, our internet here is terrible uh, anyway, uh, if I turn the, uh, the camera off, our internet gets a little better. To, I guess it's just the bandwidth. Uh, next week, uh, October 2nd, we're having a PCR board meeting. And uh, if you have any suggestions for topics, please email them to me. Uh, if you don't have my email, it's simple. It's frank at frankmarkovich.com. If you can't remember that, if you go to the PCR website, there's contact us. Uh, you could also send it to pcrpres.org. It'll get to me. But uh, anyway, any topics. And it's an open meeting in that everybody's allowed to attend. Uh, we do ask that uh, members uh, participate towards the end of the meeting. There'll be a time for members to say things because we have some business we have to do. Uh, the meeting will last uh, approximately two hours. I hope a little less than that. I will see. And there's already a number of topics. But if you have topics that you want to discuss, email them to me or Mike O'Dorney. If you know Mike, uh, he's the uh, secretary. Uh, I think that's what the title is. Mike, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so that's the first thing. The second thing is uh, I've been in contact with the people for the PCR convention next year, 2022 in Roner Park, and the registrations are a little low. Uh, but please, if, if you intend on going, send it in as soon as possible. Looks like it's going to be a great convention. If we get enough, I, I will have a meet the board or, or meet and greet. Um, I'm going to set up. I'm going to wait until January to do that. And it'll probably be Wednesday night. There will also be a board meeting at that convention on Wednesday. Uh, but the convention actually doesn't start till Thursday. So please uh, register. Lastly, uh, I'm meeting with people from the Sierra Seminar. And I run the West Side Reunion. And we're meeting a week and a half or so to discuss at the moment, we have a problem because the place where we meet, the uh, Sonora Senior Center, is absolutely closed. You can't get in there. So we're going to talk about uh, options if that's still the case. Uh, I expect them to open. I've talked to uh, John Zach, who's in contact with the museum, uh, with the Senior Center, and he says it'll be open. So if you have any questions, if, if you have any topics for uh, the board meeting, send them to me. Or if you have any questions right now, just please ask. Good 
come on, there's got to be some challenging questions out there for Frank. I stepped away for, oops, I stepped away for a minute, Phil. Are you talking about questions for the, uh, for the trip? Because I stepped no, away. No, we kind of, we kind of draw, we kind of closed away from that. And, and Frank gave an update on the board meeting of the PCR convention and, was actually asking if there's anyone had questions or topics for the board meeting, which is next Saturday, the PCR board meeting. Oh, okay. Sorry. I hate no, stepping no. away like that, but I do have a question about that uh, trip. If I could just real quick. Sure. Is that okay. What Absolutely. time did you say? I didn't hear what time the train is supposed to arrive. It, it's so, 1110, I believe. Okay. Okay. So if we drive up there, which is most likely going to be the case, probably quarter after 11 would be a good target time. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Sorry again, I didn't mean to change the subject. Oh, no worries. Yeah, and, and that is an option, obviously, driving up. Right. Thanks. Well, I guess there's no question, but you can email them to me, and uh, I'm pretty good about answering. Um, usually, it might take a day or two. Uh, I'm sort of falling behind a little bit. So thank you all. Thanks, Frank. Um, Frank, this is not a question, but I just want to say thank you for all your hard work. Thank Absolutely. you. That's appreciated. Absolutely. Um, and by the way, I mentioned earlier, Bob Gardine is, is going to step up on helping our website and our uh, communications going forward. Pete um, is ch becoming very visually challenged. And so computer work is becoming more and more challenging. Um, and by the way, the, the whole website is one of the things we're going to talk about at the board meeting. Um, we need to update our website, the PCR region website, et cetera. So that will become a discussion area um, going forward. Uh, so I think unless there's any other commentary on kind of future activities, um, we kind of come to a time where if anyone has anything they'd like to show or talk about, um, go for it. And because David asked before that we do this first so that folks uh, kind of if they have something they want to say can do that before we kick into it could be a probably a 45 minute or longer uh, clinic. So. Yeah, I'll run the clinic for as long as people have questions or want to see things. So, yeah, just <laughs> I figured I'd be best at the end. Yep. No, absolutely. I think that makes the most sense. So I. I just want to comment that, that this past couple of weeks, I've had absolutely no interest in doing anything with a model train. <laughs> just lost all my mojo. That's the nice thing about the hobby, Ken, is you don't have to. Yeah. You can kick back and take a break, and it's just fine. Yeah, your mojo will come back. Just give it time. Uh, That's okay. Ken. Probably yeah, after another we'll... avenue of this is I was just reading an article in Craftsman and this guy has this beautiful railroad down in Texas. And he says, I forced myself to go out there and work on it. And I'm looking at this railroad going, I think I'm going to try that. <laughs> well, you know what will happen is after watching Mr. Gibbons and his amazing soldering demonstration, you'll be very inspired and you'll get back out to doing stuff. I've already got the soldering iron in my hand. <laughs> oh. See, Watch it, out. it's a preemptive soldering strike. It already worked. Ready to solder. <laughs> yeah, I, I've, I've got a couple of Nick's hobby, uh, decoder buddies on order. Decoder buddies? Yeah. Haven't you ever see, seen those? I've never heard of a decoder buddy. It's, it's a, a substitute motherboard for... Um, uh, 21-pin uh, decoders, and mm. I think you might have an 8-pin version uh, as well. But what it is, is it has all of the pads uh, laid out, including the pads for a uh, Keep Alive, oh, so that you know exactly where they are. That's just cheating. Hey. <laughs> hey, man, you use the tools that are available to you. There's nothing wrong with that. Oh, the judge yeah, for 10 bucks, it's, so it's worth every penny. Okay, I'm going to share something silly here. Um, you go on eBay. You say, oh, look, there's an Amtrak FP45 for a reasonable price. And you get it, and you realize what you got 
was a very, very early Bachmann FP45 with the rubber band tires, one of the little toy motors. And um, I said, what can I do with it? And I'm watching uh, Virtual Rail Fan, and you see occasionally you see open loads consisting of a locomotive on a flat car. So here you have the front end. Let's see. Uh, could you please, uh, host, could you please put up the uh, my iPad? Oh, okay. Hang on. I got the wrong one up, eh? Well, you have a choice with me. There we go. Okay. So the engine came around the corner in a river and a deep, steep valley and found a landslide with a 50-ton boulder. Hit left front, tipped it over. It then slid down the embankment. Actually, bear with me. Slid down the embankment. And uh, for some reason, Amtrak wanted it back. So the wreck crew put it on a flat car. But here's where I made my mistake. Second mistake. The first mistake was accidentally buying a little junk locomotive. But the second mistake was this car's capacity is 193,000 pounds. And an F40PH weighs 230,000 pounds. So this uh, open load is a failure. Um, but what I've done is I've just eBayed for some old, old Athern heavy-duty flat cars. I bought, I'm going to try to get three of them, cut them up, and make a long enough heavy-duty flat car to carry this Amtrak F40PH back to Amtrak shop somewhere. But that's my, uh, that's my way to take a junk locomotive and turn it into some sort of interesting uh, open load. Next. Cool. Somebody else has to have something interesting they're doing. Okay. Oh, I'm going to share two things. I see if Frank's still here before I share the second one, because the first one, the first one's more innocuous. The second one will be not. Uh, so I'm still I, there. You're still here. So yeah, the second one is a cab ride oriented thing. Whoa. Um, so this is actually, we're building, so the, the layout in Pleasanton, when they went to DCC, they wired DCC directly into the two original DC blocks. And the layout's almost 110 feet long. Um, each side has at least nine main blocks and five or six other blocks. And of course, they were wired with the wires being somewhat apart. And if you understand what a dipole antenna is, what you realize is, we each, each DCC circuit has like four to 10 50 foot dipole antennas on it. So the noise level was unbelievable. So what we've done, we're doing is we're rebuilding the DCC in three power station locations. And this is the first one. So, you know, it's got a, the starts at the bottom with NCE with a boot 10 amp booster. The fan that you see goes on the side. It's, it's now mounted in place, but I didn't take a picture of it. Um, and then there are circuit breakers. And then we've got a DC to DC relay set up. So you can actually power the loops on DC. But what happens is going to happen. All the turnouts will go to normal. So you can be on a loop running DC, but you can never leave the loop. And everything outside the loops will be turned off. So at the top, you can see there are, in this side, there are three outputs. There's DCA, which is the DC a blocks DCB, which DCB blocks, and then everything else, which doesn't get powered. Um, and then we found these little liver connectors at the top. And I don't know if you've used those, but they're pretty brilliant. I bought a bag of 10 of them for this with the ones that have the screws to be able to mount them. And they make connecting these 12 gauge wires really pretty easy. So, um, and that's, uh, this is essentially the, the panel. And then there are three of these I guess it should be rotated here so you can see it better. Um, three of these detector panels that'll be mounted in the fascia with kind of a you know oblong cutout to see them is where all the detector boards are. Um, so that was kind of the production side of things. Um, I had an opportunity, and John John can talk a bit about this because I was there on Saturday and John was there actually on Thursday. And John, I'm gonna pull a blank on a name. Um, if John's there, he can help me. 
this is a, it's an O scale layout down by Madeira. It's 38 by 80. And it's just amazing. And I actually took these pictures for the O scale folks in Pleasanton. Uh, but I thought I'd just put them in here. Uh, this is a cool piece of animation actually made by Lionel for you, for O scalers. Uh, inside, there are two model railroads that run around, and there's one that runs in that circular thing at the front. There's a crossing sign that lights up. It's a hugely animated thing. Um, and we're working right now to figure out where to put one in Pleasanton because to have a button on the fascia, as this does um, to push, is, is brilliant. Um, and these were some outside pictures. So, and John was there on Saturday. The, um, the team from the Fresno um, area, from the daylight um, division that sponsored the PCR convention last year that went virtual had a, a bit of a, a thank you uh, event. Um, originally we were scheduled to have a sugar pine uh, railroad expedition um, during the convention. And so what they did was actually scheduled this at the sugar pine railroad had a, a dinner and then a train ride. And so these are some pictures of 10. This is actually a superheated um, uh, three truck Shea, which I think this is, as I remember, as I remember, Kakama was the largest Shea, one of the largest Shea's ever made. Uh, this is the other Shea, which is in the shop, which is 15, which is not supercharged. And apparently there's about a 50% tractive difference between these because of that. Um, so I just thought I'd ju jump through a few of these shots. So now I'm going to close that and jump over here. So this. Uh, Phil, just a quickie. Uh, the layout that you showed the O scale on, that's Bob Jackal, J A K. Bob Jackal, that's right. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate that. I knew it was Bob, but I didn't want to say his last name wrong, and I forgot to look it back up beforehand. Yeah, I was over there a couple months ago and did the Sugar Pine and his layout at the, at the same time. It's a fantastic layout. And so, by the way, John, I think John stepped away, but John was there on Thursday and did a video of that layout. And you right. know, he does those. And, and by the way, I'm going to put in just a, a plug for John. You know, if you go to John's um, to the page, you'll find there's a Patreon thing. And if you join as a Patreon and basically you give you know, a few bucks a month or whatever, um, John gives you access to 4K videos, which are pretty brilliant if you've got a good video feed. So that as I, me, I just I just watched the new one he just released on Robin Gilstrom's N scale McKean car build which is very interesting. He just opened that up uh, at nine o'clock this morning. So thank you, John, for that one. Cool. Um, so anyway, before I share this, this, this next one. So Frank actually won the cab ride on, uh -huh. on the, during the excursion that we were going to have during the convention. So when we got down here on Saturday, um, there was a realization that there were four cab rides. There are two cab rides down and two cab rides back. And after a discussion, the group decided that the folks that were really heavily involved, some of the out of town folks. Um, so Bruce Morton and I ended up doing the cab ride down. So I, I felt, cause I kind of feel like I stole this from Frank. I thought I should at least make a video of a bit of it. So I've got three short videos. And I'm going to go ahead and share those and, and kind of let you guys see what it was. I'm going to put these um, after I do this video and put this video and have the last video done up on our website. I'll put this up on YouTube as well. Um, so let me make this full screen. Actually, I have to stop sharing and reshare because I or actually, that's right, I have to start sharing here. I have to turn the optimize for video on. OK, can everybody see that? Is the is the volume good there? It's good. Okay. So one of the things you're going to notice is they have water in the fuel, in the, and they took 35 gallons of water out of the tender 
that morning, but occasionally the fire would go out and then re-pop like your barbecue does when it lights. Um, and that's Bruce next to me, and they're behind the engineer at this point. Here's a second one. So the very end, you go up the hill. So this was all downhill. You can kind of see that. At the very end, it's going uphill.
Mario Kart. So anyway, the one thing I blew is I stopped recording right there and I turned and I watched and the engineer and they stopped, reached over and closed about 12 valves. So if you saw that back end, there are all those valves on it. Nothing's labeled. And when they stopped to keep everything from blowing up, you've got to close a bunch of valves. So you got to know which ones they are. I, I thought it was really interesting. It's so indicative of how much of a... Uh, kind of closed community that was because you clearly had to learn from somebody who understood how to do it but apprenticeship no exactly yeah. exactly and it but Phil, it was very Phil, very nice i i could we had a problem at our cabin we had repairs going on just was a bad day for him no no it was it was like i said it was brilliant um i and it, it highly recommend it if you get the opportunity uh, I did not do the uphill because when I, there was a comment made that, well, the downhill's kind of nice because they're just riding it down. The uphill is much very loud because the engine's running hard, and you kind of got that at the end. Uphill, the other way was basically like that the whole time. You had to yell in order to communicate. So, uh, Jonathan, I think you've got an echo issue in your system with your speaker and your microphone. So, anyway, that was all I had to share. Hey, Phil, uh, my apology. I came in late. Was that from your trip uh, to the narrow gauge uh, convention? No, east? that was the Sugar Pine Railroad, which is up out of Madeira, up at the south end of Yosemite. Oh, right. Yeah. And it's, uh, yeah, it's a you know, a tourist railroad and they do, uh, I think they do a couple of trains a day and then they do this, the train we were on, which is an evening train. So what they have is a dinner. Um, and there are kind of the pictures there. You can see it. They've got the shop and next to the shop, they've got some tables and you have a dinner. There was actually a very good, very reasonable meal as well. And then they take the train down and it's kind of a family thing. They have a campfire show and then take the train back. The only the only kind of downside is that when you come back, when we came back, it was completely dark. And so you're going through the redwood trees in the dark and you basically see only the first tree or two. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I wrote it years ago, many yeah, it, years ago. It was a really nice trip. I, I didn't stay at the narrow gauge Inn. their price was $340 a night. And I decided that was too steep. I Ooh. stayed up the road at the uh, you know old motel that's now become a lodge. The upscale word for a motel that got a paint job. So how was your trip out east? I did, ended up not going. I've ended up everything. I decided not to go to the narrow gauge convention. I don't know if Chuck is on. Um, he's yeah. not on. Oh, there he is. I am. He Chuck went and can talk to you about it. He had a great time. I, I wimped out. I have to say I wimped out. I decided I, I decided I just didn't want to spend that much time in an airplane. And then the event I'm supposed to do next week went virtual about a week ago. So I'm staying here. Yeah, makes sense. I, I don't know when, you know, but I am excited about going up to Sacramento, though. I think that's a great trip. It was a great trip going up there. The, the nice thing about, you know, if you want to do a trip, nice thing about that Sugar Pine Railroad was it's really all outdoors. You know, you can go do it as an event. 
you're eating outdoors. Uh, you know, I don't know, you know, if at some point if we wanted to, that could be something we probably could talk about doing a coast road trip up there. Um, but I'm sure May is the next time is the conventions there. Um, the shop tour was really cool because they do most of their repairs. The, one of the things that was really interesting was they showed us a, the brake shoes that were their original, more iron brake shoes. And apparently someone at some point says, well, why can't we use the composite shoes they use today on the railroads? The, the contours are the same, the radius, the wheels are the same. And basically they went from something that weighs about 70 pounds and lasts a month to something that weighs 12 pounds and lasts two years. <laughs> so, but you know, I had to make the comment, you're no longer prototypical, so. Depends on what date your prototype is. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah, but it was, yeah, it was pretty typical, but you're one to one. Yeah. <laughs> but again, I, I highly recommend it both as a tour and, and going. And, and like I said, if you know, there's some interest, that's one of the things that as we kind of begin to plan activities in the future, it could be, you know, some sort of a planned activity. Um, it's a bit of a trek. Just, you know, it's a good two and a half hour drive from Pleasant, two hour plus drive from Pleasanton. So South Bay is probably the same, but if you get up on the peninsula, it's probably pushing three hours. Anyway, yeah. that's all I have. So I'll throw it back. Does anybody else have anything else? Or? Beautiful. No. I've uh, got a question for you. The O-Scale Railroad that you showed, is he open for visitation? Is he open for contact? Um, I would... I, I don't know. I'm not sure. I can probably send an email and see if he is. Um, like I said, you know, the, the, the thing that'll be interesting is when um, John's video comes out of that, it'll be a, I think that'll be a really good video. Um, well, you know, next, <laughs> yeah. You know, and next time they have, next time they have their regional convention in the daylight, you know, they, if they have it over on that side, I probably will be open. Um, you know, other not really nice railroads over there as well. When I went up there a couple of months ago, um, I went up with uh, Tom Van Horn from Turlock. Uh, he's the Sierra, Sierra division. And uh, what, uh, what he did was he just called a couple of days ahead to make sure that uh, Bob knew we were, yep. we were interested in coming. And, uh, but he, uh, he seems to be very uh, open to having uh, visitors who, are kind of knowledgeable and know and know what they're doing and know how to behave. Uh, so I think it, it could be done. You just have to contact him ahead of time, let him know you're coming. Yep. I, and by, and by the way, if there's an, you know, if there's an interest in making sure that everyone's aware of those, those kind of things, because, you know, when, when the other divisions have their regional conventions, you know, if you can go, it's a great time to go and see some layouts, you know, and they're, you know, it's like, just like, you know, when they have a lot of people have some sort of divisional event like that, that you can go to not a convention, an event. I'm doing the pause to see if anyone else has something they'd like to talk about. Well, I can show, I can show you my shirt and it'll, the narrow gauge uh, convention was great. You got Jack. You, you got to turn you're really your camera. Your, your your camera is not turned on. Huh. See if you go ahead and turn your camera on. So how's that? Yeah, much better. Yeah, no, I much better. <laughs> There's the shirt, and uh, you really missed a good show. The only thing was the. Uh, the vendor's room was was kind of light. We uh, we had several people that were doing uh, individual like trade show items, and then we had a couple of a uh, couple of major vendors that were there selling uh, a lot of Walkman and uh, and a lot of their. Uh, they're private things, but uh, the usual big timers from uh, past conventions didn't show, which was kind of disappointing. 
Well, yeah, one of, one of the things that all the Canadians said was, you know, and there's a pretty good contingent in the, in the narrow gauge space from Canada. They right. all said they couldn't go home because of the, the way the quarantine rules are. So it's yeah. hard to come for them. Yeah, they, they made a big hole. But, uh, but, but the good news is... I was see a couple of them. The, the good news is that Tacoma is next year, and this will be over by next year. If everybody gets shot up. Come on, it's going to be over, guys. Let's, be, let's all be optimistic. It'll be over. The power of optimistic thinking. It'll get over. I just keep thinking the Black Plague showed up about 4,000 years ago, and it's still with us. <laughs> yeah. Well, if, if we're at a good point, I'm going to go ahead and um, take a pause for just a moment, and then I'm going to introduce David and just let him take it away from here. Um, so with that, I'm going to do my pause, and then I'll throw it to David. You good, David? Cool. Okay. Okay. I'm going to now kick it over to uh, David Gibbons, who's going to um, go ahead and um, talk to us about how you solder on circuit boards and other components. Take it away, David. Okay, let's see. First of all, can folks hear me? Yeah. All right, that's one step. Yeah, I had um, I was foolish enough to uh, try to do an update on my computer before the meeting, and of course that went as well as you might expect when you ask a computer to be ready for an event. But it seems it's working. Phil, have I got the ability to share my screen? Hello, Phil. Can you give me screen sharing, please? It is turned on. Um, try, go ahead and try. I, I, I totally, yeah, I absolutely do. You just. OK. Uh, first of all, a quick reprise of some of the stuff that we talked about. Uh, do folks see a slide soldering for model railroaders? Just just throw it into slideshow mode down at the bottom. Uh, that little little slide screen. Yeah, there I'll you go. That. Excellent. Okay. Right. So this is an extension of what I did uh, previously. All right. We're going to re quickly review principles. I don't know. Well, let me check. Uh, could somebody, could anybody speak up who did not, was not able to attend my previous presentation? Was there anybody here who did not attend the previous presentation? I did not attend the previous I presentation. All I right. did not. Then uh, bear with me. Uh, those who have, we're going to do, uh, go back and review some basic principles. Okay, so an alloy is what we're talking about when we're soldering because alloys have different physical properties than the two metals that are put into the alloy. And the key item is the last bullet here, which is the alloys that we make when we do soldering melt at ridiculously lower temperatures than the parent or base metals. Here's what we want to have. We are going to ideally have solder and copper hot and the two mix at the interface between the two of them forming another alloy. Solder is an alloy of usually copper and tin. Um, then you can have pure copper, but when you put them together and they're hot and there's no contaminants in the way, they actually mix and that alloy has interesting properties. By the way, if you have questions, want me to discuss something more, then uh, please uh, just uh, tell me or just speak up and say that uh, you have a question or a comment. Now, this is one way things don't work, which is dirt, corrosion, oil, or oxidation, which can be different from corrosion. You can have an acid causing a corrosion, but just exposure to the air in the case of copper, will form a layer on top of it, or brass. Exposure to air, even if it's pure, clean brass, add a little time with the air touching it, it will oxidize, 
and that will make your solder sit on top of the copper, even if it's hot, but not mix <clears throat> into the alloy you want. Cold so copper does not work. It's got to be up to temperature. The solder can be hot, but if the copper is cold, again, you will not succeed. Impurities in the solder. Uh, if you are the sort of model railroader who has a ball, a, bar, a roll of solder that you picked up on an auction, and it's obviously about 85 years old and was stored in the ocean or in a muddy basement ground, or God knows, it is going to be contaminated. And again, you'll fail because the solder itself is full of impurities, which can also include cooking the solder. If you have solder and you have it up to temperature for a minute, 10 minutes, half an hour, eventually the solder literally burns and will also be unusable. You don't reuse solder in that sense. Uh, if you had a joint that was soldered, you remove the old solder and put fresh in so you get away from this problem. So the thing we want to do is we need to make sure that the impurities or contamination is gone. You have, if it's covered with a, an inch of oil, you obviously need to wash the oil off. But the impurities that are involved in chemical changes in the copper due to attacks by oxygen or acid or finger oils, who knows, you need to get that off. And the way we do it is with flux. And usually uh, we use a rosin flux in model railroading or electronics. Acid flux is good for plumbers, which have massive copper pipes and a little bit of corrosion from leftover acid isn't going to destroy it. But for us, we use a rosin. Um, actually, the, the rosins, uh, natural rosins, come, I think, from a, a pine tree um, material. But when you heat it up, it strips the impurities off the copper for a short period of time. If you sit and cook it and cook it and cook it, you'll again degrade the rosin and recontaminate the surface. So um, you don't sit for a long period of time. Okay, now, come on, there we go. Now, heating things is very important and that you heat all of the work. On the left, yeah, you're heating the rail, but the copper's not hot. And the next one, you're heating the copper, but the rail's not hot. The third one is what you want. That is that the copper is heated by the iron tip and the rail is heated so that you get both of them up to temperature so that particularly the flux can do its work because the flux doesn't work when it's cold. It works when it's heated up. All right. And now the other thing here is to get the heat to the work, you need to increase or have as much contact area as possible. So in example one, where it's a dry tip and you're just touching the tip, you'll get a little bit of heat flow, but your area of contact is very small. If you add a little solder in that orientation, like let's say, for example, you're stuck, you're reaching inside the shell of a locomotive to get down in, into a circuit component or something down in there, you may only be able to get the tip in there. No jokes from any of you wise, wise acres. Um, a little bit of solder, fresh solder, will help provide a better path for the heat to get to the work. Where you can, what's even better is, is to move the solder tip to increase the contact surface or area. This lets more heat flow to the work. Now, again, alloys are happening all over the place. Nickel silver is an alloy. There's no silver in nickel silver, by the way. It has a silvery appearance in some of the nickel silver alloys that are used. Uh, our model railroad nickel silver, though, is generally not silver, really silvery. But you set that down on copper and have your flux going and it's all hot and the solder flows in there and starts to mix an alloy, you'll actually have nickel silver alloy on top, then an alloy of solder and nickel silver, 
then if the solders fill any gap, there'll be some solder here, and then there'll be an alloy of copper with the solder. So all of these things produce um, the sort of joint we want, which is a fair mechanical strength, good electrical conductivity, which is the main thing, of course, we're wanting to do when we're soldering. Now, and what are you doing? <laughs> oh, I love computers. Okay, let's try that again. The, uh, come on, come on, good boy. Uh, yesterday, I talked to Bruce Chubb for a while. I was part of the very early group of people that worked with Bruce in doing refinements to the CMRI stuff. And I talked to him and I asked, could I get permission to do some, use some of his material in this tutorial today? And there we go. All right. And I realize as I look at this, the scan that I did is not enough high resolution, but you can still see the soldering iron tip. Here we're talking about soldering on a circuit board. Notice the tip is come up against the lead of the component coming up through the circuit board and touching the copper that is the pad on the circuit board. Why are you moving ahead? It's decided to do a slideshow, hasn't it? Uh, so that again is heat both all the, the different pieces of the work all have to be up to temperature. You apply solder not to the soldering iron in terms of doing your main joint. Now, you may, and it is recommended, that you apply a little fresh clean solder to the tip to help the heat transfer to the work, but ideally you then apply the solder to the work, not the tip, after that point. The little bit of solder you put on the tip is just there to get the heat to flow. Now the pieces are up to temperature, then you apply the solder to the work and then you'll get uh, a good joint because the solder is melting onto the work and the, and the flux in the solder is working to make sure that you get the alloy forming between the solder and the work. Now, the shape of the solder is generally a uh, in this case, Bruce uses the term tent. That is, it is flowed out, flowed out onto the circuit board and saw and flowed up onto the lead. He uses the term tent here. And you want it to form all the way around the lead and on the pad. And I'm going to be showing you some examples of that, uh, actual examples I have here. I've soldered up some demonstrations for you guys to look at. Okay, pausing here to check. Questions, comments, knock-knock jokes. What do we got? All right, onwards. And then clipping off the lead at the top of the, uh, what he calls the tent, is a good recommended practice. You obviously don't want to cut off so much of it that there's hardly any solder between the uh, circuit board copper trace and the lead and long long leads are just a way to snag yourself so shortening those is a good idea now the if the solder after you're done has a frosted or stippled look typically what that means is it's been disturbed while it was cooling and solidifying there's a structure to solder metal any metal as it solidifies what's usually considered to be a, a, a crystal structure but if you move it around while it's cooling down and solidifying into that crystal structure, you weaken the solder mechanically and it is prone to failure. B, the now what he does here in B is you'll notice on either side of the lead coming through, there's black showing that it's just rosin and the solder never actually got to the lead. So that joint will fail because there's actually not any electrical connection. What would that way would well, how that would happen is is somebody got the soldering iron tip on the circuit board but never touched the lead. The lead wasn't hot. 
the rosin didn't attack the contamination on the surface of the lead, even a shiny lead can have stuff on it that prevents the solder from getting together with and alloying with the lead. Step C over here on the right is the lead was heated up nice and hot and the rosin did its job and the solder got onto the lead fine, but the pad was cold, the, the circuit board trace never got hot and so the rosin couldn't do its work and you don't have a joint. Notice here the bulge. Instead of the solder flowing out nicely onto the, lead, onto the circuit board trace, it's like this and that is a very good sign that you have an, a poor joint that most likely is not going to give you good electrical connection. Okay, now, Phil, would you be so kind as to spotlight the iPad that I'm using? I certainly will. All set, I'm going to replace you. All right. And are you done sharing? Done there sharing. We go. There we go. Okay. Good. All set. That? All right, now, what I'm going to do here is to um, demonstrate the circuit board stuff. Actually, let me let me step back from, for a second here. There's two things going on here though, that we can do here. We can talk about wiring on circuit cards, and we can also talk about doing the wiring of electronic components that might have to do with something like putting together a DCC setup in a locomotive with some headlights and such. I can skip the circuit board stuff. I can skip the DCC. I could do both or I could do a little of one and the other. Um, would you guys have, does anybody care about seeing circuit board soldering? Yes. Oh. There we go. <laughs> okay. Uh, can uh, rosin core solder please always? Uh, plumbers who use acid core solder and, and thus sort of have the atomic bomb of fluxing can get away with using plain solder. But for us to avoid uh, the mess that comes from applying lots of external flux, the rosin core flux is vastly superior vastly superior because when you apply rosin core flux, the rosin is immediately delivered to where it needs to do its work. It's a can't miss sort of thing. That's the reason why all serious electronic solders run rosin core. Um, there's various brands, Kester, Alpha Metals, Ursin, and others that offer electronic grade solid rosin core solders um, and it's just as far as I'm concerned if you're not using it you're looking for uh, looking for trouble but um, you know just spend the money get get fresh rosin core solder in a small diameter and um, so that you don't flood the work this is uh, 32 thousandths um, of the um, good old um, solder I'm using here. The uh, WRMA is mildly activated solder. That's a good choice for the work that we do on our railroading. Um, it's also, if you didn't get it all off the circuit board, it isn't going to give you as much trouble. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do here is we're going to do a quick look at soldering circuit boards and I've got some sample boards I've put together and I'll first of all I'm going to pick on Seth Newman because Seth sent me I bought some boards from Seth and I tried to make some uh, mis I made a mistake board showing some of the ways things can go wrong and that's what we'll look at here now these boards are good quality boards. Seth doesn't offer low quality junk. Could you please switch spotlight to my iPad, sir?
and fill. Ah, let's see. Can I do that? Nah, I lost you on the screen here. Hang on. I just got to take you off. It's actually up. But I'll just remove it off there. of you. Yeah, you it go. shows more detail yep. uh, this way. Thank you. All right. Now, here you see uh, the connector that's going to connect up to my Chubb uh, S-Mini that's going to have inputs and outputs connected through these cards. And of, of interest here is that you may notice that the holes, the leads are much smaller than the holes which is an interesting challenge for soldering because it is easy to make mistakes. When the lead is a very tight fit, things work better, but this is a great way to show some of the ways things can go wrong. Uh, my go wrong demonstrator is this guy here. And it shows some of the popular failures that one can have. All right. You notice how the solder is going between the two traces? Got excited, poured too much solder in, and the solder went across and connected to the other trace. This is called a solder bridge and uh, obviously is not going to bring happiness to anybody. But that's something to avoid and it's one, use fine diameter solder. Two, don't try to solder two traces at the same time because you may end up with two traces soldered together. Next problem is inadequate solder. And one of the ways you can tell that is when you can see through the hole next to the tray, next to the lead. This has several problems. The, the biggest one is, is that as you sit there and go short on the solder and don't fill all the way around, this is much, much weaker mechanically. This one here, there was a tiny bit of solder here, but if I push on the lead, you'll notice it moves. It is actually not connected. That is that with a little bit of movement or jostling or something, the tiny bit of solder that connected them broke and you have now a no connection or an intermittent connection. And here you see another one like that and another one like that. They may hold, they may not. This one also, if you guys can see it moving, you may think, oh yeah, I got it soldered not so much. Uh, I think in this one I heated the pad but I didn't heat the lead and so I don't think any solder actually got onto the lead here coming through the board so this failed joint. You want to apply enough solder to fill the hole because when it is full all around the lead it is now fully supported so that it's much more strong mechanically. This lead here with solder all the way around it is very solid. You can depend on the joint. Now, let's note here the way the solder is nice and silver and here's the tent shape that Chubb talked about. It flowed out onto the pad and it flows up onto the trace. And it's like that all the way around. That's what we're looking for. Now, the thing about this is, is that if you can't see what you're doing, if you cannot see the traces that you're sold, the, the leads that you're soldering, you can't see the solder, then you are leaving yourself open to all these problems. And throwing lots of solder at a joint that you can't see may end up doing this. You may bridge, short out stuff. And so visibility of the work is very important to you if you're doing soldering. Uh, this can be a real challenge when you're working down inside the, the shell of a locomotive. And so get out your visor, get lots of light, because if you can't see it, you cannot solder it reliably. 
Now, on you can't see it, there's another issue here, which is, you notice how hard it is actually to see the solder bridge here because there's a lot of flux sitting here. Come on now, focus on the piece. There's a lot of flux here. Uh, and this flux obscures the state of the thing that you're soldering. So flux removal can be an important quality uh, thing for post inspection of your work. Solder removal can involve buying uh, a spray that's designed to clean it off or elbow grease and 99% alcohol, rubbing alcohol, isopropyl alcohol. Here, what I did is I applied uh, paste flux to these nuts. This is a optimized detector motherboard from Chubb, as you might guess, <laughs> sort of obvious, but you can see the discoloration where there's flux sitting on the board. But down here, I got out a toothbrush and my rubbing alcohol and just scrubbed it. It isn't perfect. If you spend money and buy some of the cleaning sprays, it does a better job. But the point is to get heavy flux deposits off so that you can see if you are um, successful in making a good joint. Now, by the way, here is a little, right there where the pointer is, here you can see where as I came off with my soldering iron, I touched another trace and left a bit of solder. If that had been longer, maybe it would have bridged across. This is why a post inspection is important when you're doing a lot of soldering on a circuit board. Now, you will notice here, let's go to where it's clean, how, again, the solder has flowed up onto the nut and onto the work. When I soldered these guys, I had to make sure that the solder was attaching to both the nut and the trace. And because these nuts are um, plated and don't take solder as well, these are places where I used a flux, a paste flux. Uh, even rosin core is maybe not quite enough. This one here, from uh, this one I got from our friends over at uh, Fast Tracks, but SRA is a flux they recommend. Notice it says rosin paste flux because it won't, after time, uh, leftover stuff won't start chewing into uh, delicate wires and uh, traces on circuit boards. This is just a tiny little uh, uh, applicator. There's a tiny little uh, fuzzy in there so you could apply it to a small spot. The thing is, if you don't get it right, it can look right and fail. This, was, uh, this is a switch machine driver board uh, that I'm working on building up, uh, partly because I wanted to have something to show you guys. And here I went through and I tried to get all the nuts soldered onto the board. You'll see here the soldered flows. The soldered flowed onto the nut. You can see it there. But this next one right here, you see the outline of the nut, but the solder only, even though I melted, the whole pad was melted. I didn't use enough flux and the solder was not able to grab the nut. Here's the nut in question. And there's just no sign that any solder got onto this nut. And so the joint failed. Um, in this case, getting enough heat and a little more flux would have made a big difference. And I'm going to digress here because the work you're doing and the solder tip you use mean make a difference. Okay, I'm running a uh, Weller soldering uh, soldering system, and this is one of their 
older school but still fine temperature controlled ones. This tip is the same as this one, but notice this very oh, long shit. thin tips and a big heavy tip. I actually use this big heavy tip to solder these nuts because I have to heat up not just a tiny, tiny lead to, you know, I'm not heating up this pad and this trace here. I'm heating up a big chunk of metal. And this big tip with a little fresh solder and with some flux, paste flux added, I was able to come in. Can you see I have a big contact area with the nut? which means the heat flows rapidly and brings it up to soldering temperature quickly. If you didn't have that big tip, then you would have to do something like this to lay this tip in like that and get it so the side of the tip is touching, get as much contact as possible. Again, a little fresh solder to help that heat transfer in makes a big difference too. But if your iron has the ability to use different tips, having different tips for different work can be very useful. These very thin long ones, for example, to reach down inside a shell of a locomotive and solder a very fine wire to a very fine lead on a um, light emitting diode might be just the ticket, whereas this thing would be wholly inappropriate to do that kind of work. So having an iron with different tips can be helpful to us depending on our work. Does anybody out there have uh, irons with the ability to change your tips? Uh, reality check, can anybody hear me? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And yes, some of us do. Good. All right. So sure, Seth does. Yeah. Well, Seth would. <laughs> <laughs> if Seth takes the, best, the other question is how how many soldering irons do people have? Right. So I actually have two. I have a a, a gun style with a for big jobs that have to heat, and then I have an electronics temperature controlled one with a, a temperature gauge where you set it based on what solder you're using. Now, your gun, sir, how many watts is that gun? You got to have two guns, a 40 watt and an 80 watt. Yeah, something. <laughs> okay, like so little, some little guns, you don't need a lot of power. Um, any of the work we do, even the rail, um, this iron I have here is, uh, I think, a. Uh, a 40 watt and I saw the rail with it at least code 83 quite comfortably um, the big guns um, are a um, big guns can instantly destroy stuff but those little small guns you mentioned uh, are going to be more appropriate okay so let's see Seth is uh, throwing some stuff up here let me catch up with his chat and so I can comment on that. Um, Seth uses a ultrasonic cleaner with isopropyl alcohol to clean his boards. And thank you, I had not thought of that. But do remember, if you are using an ultrasonic cleaner with isopropyl alcohol, you better have good ventilation so A, you don't kill what remaining brain cells we model railroaders have left. And you also have the problem of vaporized, vaporized alcohol being a fire hazard. So yeah, good ventilation. I think I do that sort of with my garage with the door open. But there's one way to clean boards. I'll have to try that because I have an ultrasonic cleaner, which is too small for any boards I have except for something like that. So. Um, if you have a um, big, um, big ultrasonic cleaner, you can uh, do that. And uh, Beth says the nuts are troublesome on here, but I would 
argue that it's a matter of if you've got your technique down they're not so troublesome but different strokes for different folks on that all right now is there does anybody want to see um, some well first of all let's look at some other professionally done soldering on a circuit card this is uh, Scott uh, who is currently being a supplier of finished circuit boards for people that want chub boards and this is an example of a well done job of soldering and cleaning and you may notice how all the solder nicely is all bright silver it all flows out from the lead onto the circuit traces this is good work that's what you want to have and it's been cleaned thoroughly so it's easy to see the good work but you can just see how those tents that Bruce talks about are present all the way around here this is the sort of thing you want to have now I'm going to just do a few joints here no not those sort of joints quiet jokers all right this is a circuit board a brand new circuit board I loaded it with components yesterday now you can do one at a time for the purposes of this tutorial I loaded the board so that I could uh, show you guys soldering some different joints now but before I start this thing questions or comments on what you what you're seeing here yeah I got one David <clears throat> oh. you didn't mention tinning either the nuts or the leads especially where you might have a hole that's larger than the lead is that of any value when you're working on these boards well on a solid lead that is clean not contaminated or dirty or corroded tinning on a solid lead not so much but tinning on a stranded lead this by the way is the harness for a DCC decoder that I'm going to wire up here uh, once I finish fooling around with the circuit boards but tinning these can help a lot on any stranded leads you have to deal with um, tinning is I think a very good idea partly because once you tin leads these are some more leads I'm going to use to do the throw together the DCC decoder once they're tinned do you see that loop I formed in the green lead there that was easy to form once it was tinned uh, in this case what I'm using is is a round nose a fine round nose pliers and a tinned lead makes that much much easier to to do to get leads to behave when you're doing fine work in a circuit board where the leads coming through the hole you could tin it yes but it's more what I'm more concerned about frankly when I'm got a lead in a hole it's too big is trying to figure some way to keep it still while I'm working if you uh, tin it to make it fatter that might help but better is in any soldering is that things do not move while you're working and I'm going to show you on this circuit board some of the things that can be done all right this here I think is a capacitor notice how the leads are bent away from each other so it is it can't fall or move away down here this is a integrated circuit socket and I have bent over these leads so that it will stay still when I solder it now you can of course hold your finger on the other side to hold it still while you solder uh, except that you need one hand for the soldering iron and one hand for the solder so bending leads over or as I saw in this example making the lead 
capture whatever you want to solder it to. In this instance, I'm going to solder this lead to this light emitting diode. But having that curled wrap around like that is going to make it much more successful to be able to have a good joint because I'm not sitting there doing this and, and uh, we've all done it. You're sitting there and you've got the, you're trying to glue, yep, I turn it this way. You're trying to literally use a solder as glue, if you will, and get it like this. Much harder to get it to hold still. Now, if you have a third hand tool where you have it holding this and you get the wire and you bend the third hand around so they're, they're touching each other, you're going to have a better chance of having a good joint. But trying to instead make it... Come on, fingers. I'm trying to pick something up with clumsy old fingers. This is going to be a much more satisfactory joint if you have the room to do so. Sometimes it gets awful tight inside our locomotives and cabooses that we're putting lighting in. But if you can do this, it's much preferable. All right. How Let's do you first. curl? How do you curl those uh, tiny wires? Tiny round nose pliers. Oh, with that one. Okay. You could also use a tweezers. And bad language is, of course, is important. But I have found uh, giving myself the treat of buying a round nose plier. Uh, and then just sitting here and wrapping it around. Voila. Thank you. Now you could pinch this tighter around a lead. Once you get this formed, you could actually take your needle nose and pinch it down to get an even tighter uh, connection. But that's uh, one recommended trick. Now, okay, so a little bit of soldering on a circuit board just for fun. All right, now, oh, digression. All right, damp sponge. Old school. These days, uh, what apparently is recommended, I did some reading up, and people are saying, you get one of these things where it's just some bronze uh, wool and you scrub the tip with it to clean the tip. And I... Now that I've used it for a bit, yeah, it works. Supposedly, the bronze wool, when you go scrub through, it, it has two advantages. It doesn't thermally shock the soldering iron tip, which is at like 700, 800 degrees, and you're touching it to a cold, wet sponge and would cause it to fail more soon. And also, it cools the tip so that it takes a moment to get back up to temperature. And these... Issues, I think, have more to do with people that are into production soldering rather than the work we do. I use the sponge for years. Do you hear that sizzle? You know, this is, this is the, the classic, right? And you clean the tip that way. It actually cleans the tip better, but um, I'm, I'm playing around with this other metal spongy thing just, just for fun. All right, now, enough yammering. We'll do a little soldering. Now, again, a little bit of solder on the tip to wet it. Apply it to the work, touching both the pad and the lead. And now, because of where I was sitting, I couldn't see it really well. I'm going to stand up, and I'm going to do something that I recommend for those of you that, like me, no longer have young eyes. I'm going to go get my idiot visor here and put it on so I can see what the heck I'm doing on this work. So I can see that I'm putting the right amount of solder. Not too little, not too much. Here we go. I'm try not to shade the work here. Wet the tip. Okay. Apply it to the work, pressing on the lead and the pad. Apply solder. Lead and pad. Apply solder. 
Notice I'm not staying on there long because now that I can look at it and see what's happening, I can see that I've made a successful joint and I can get out of Taj. One, two, three, ah. Okay, on that one, the solder did not flow all the way around the lead and there was a void on this side. I had to come back, reheat, and apply a little more solder. It's, and again, it's that you are looking to see what is going on as you're doing the work. Okay, now we'll move over here to a lead that is a capacitor lead. Okay, can you see the tent form there? This is actually very easy soldering because you've got clean, fresh uh, leads. These are new parts that I just purchased for building this board. The You can see how bright and clean the traces are, particularly the pads. The other thing that makes this board really easy is you'll notice that here Here, uh, what are you doing? Okay, you guys still hearing me okay? Sure are, absolutely. Okay. Looking good. All right. Yeah, because I'm using two different devices <clears throat> here, sometimes I'm getting some strange things going on. Does, okay, I could, I don't know that I would add any more value to this clinic by doing more soldering on the circuit board. Does anybody have any questions or comments about soldering on circuit cards. I got one. Is body oils an issue when you're doing such fine work? Yes. Yeah, you want to have the surfaces clean. Um, if you have, you know, I sit there, I rub my finger on the side of my nose where it's nice and oily and then touch it to here, that's not going to help. There's, first of all, there's the oils and there's also acidic elements in our, our, our the, the, the oils and stuff that are on our skin, and they can foul up things. So cleanliness... Not mine. Not yours, huh? Okay. Still, cleanliness is next to godliness when you're soldering. The, the whole point of the flux is to try to clean up the, uh, clean up the surface. Okay, let me set this card aside. Even when you're done with this brother, can you turn that circuit board over? I'd love to see what's on the other side. Oh, certainly, sir. Can Curiosity you... kills me. You know, if you can't plug it in, I'm not doing it. <laughs> All right. Uh, I've lost focus, uh, Phil. We've lost focus on the Dave? Uh, iPad. Dave, I have a question, and, and that is when you don't have a hole, and you're trying to attach a wire to a board that's just got a pad. What do you do? Oh, where you're just you're just setting it down on the on the pad. Yeah. The, the there. Well, if if oh, okay. If you don't have a choice and you just have to go onto a board straight without a, a hole going through. By the way. Uh, Phil, are you there? I am. Could you return the focus to the iPad? Oh, okay, I, okay. I want to make sure we're done answering questions before I did. All right. Here we go. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is mess around with this board. Ken, we have a... Come on. Come here. There we go. So here I have a circuit board. And we're going to ignore the holes and we're going to say, I need to tack on uh, plus five to the board and they didn't give me any holes. So I look for a pad, as you mentioned here. Now, this board has been pre-tinned. And so, but let's pretend it's bare copper. Oh, wait a minute. I've got something better. Hold on a second. Look what I got. Okay. We will pretend that's, Ken will pretend that's part of something you're trying to attach the, uh, 
the piece to. If it's fresh, clean solder, you would prepare it by heating it. And by the way, notice that that isn't spreading around very much, Ken, right? I'm pulling out my paste flux and getting a little dispenser, little applicator here. Do you see where I'm, I have, I'm applying some paste flux? All right, so now I have got it ready to basically remove that lovely layer of oxidized copper that doesn't look very, you know, it doesn't look very bad, but you can see that when I tried to solder here, it didn't take very much. Wet the tip. See the difference? Now, now that I have the thing prepared, I take my tinned wire, and this goes to the other gentleman's comment about tinning the wire. Tinning the wire in this case means that with the wire tinned and with the pad or area where I want to apply it, I can just And again, we're looking for a nice, where the solder is flowed up onto the piece, onto the thing we attached. Now, does that, does that help you, Ken, in terms of trying to put a wire onto a pad? You're muted, Ken. There we go. Okay. Um, generally, I don't have that much area to work with. Of course. <laughs> that little pad is as much is about one third that it's more close to the the, the strip down here. Okay. Um, Let's go back here, Ken. Yeah. So what you're talking about is you want to tack on here. Yeah. Right. Again, uh, wire cutters. One moment. Let me prepare for a demonstration of. Uh, how to do this with again tinning is going to help you the little thing you want to go on to okay I've put tiny amount of solder there I have a tinned wire and I I tack it on there. Is that more the size you're thinking of, Ken? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking of. The thing is, you have diddly squat here for strength. Uh, that's going to be a decent electrical connection, but mechanically, if I yank on that wire, it's either going to break the solder joint or lift the trace off the board. Uh, if you have to do something like this and you want to be really secure, you might consider putting a dot of super glue on top of this thing after afterwards to to provide mechanical strength uh, because there's so little there to hold it in place but it can be done but just be aware that you just don't have much strength there no okay that's that's you know i i sometimes have some boards that i need to solder that don't have uh, holes for leads yeah and um that's that's how you would that's the way you would approach well, it. Well, the, the, putting the super glue on top. Now I've got to make sure that the the connection is actually really good electrically yep. before I put super glue on it. Yep, you might break down and uh, fire up your voltmeter and check for good continuity, low resistance for that connection before you seal it with uh, yeah. a dot of glue, whether hot glue, super glue. Your mother's uh, old glue from 1952. Um, okay, now the circuit board, where is it? There. Let's go back and do a little last bit on dealing with circuit boards here. Okay, we have the screwed up circuit board here, the uh, Seth Newman uh, provided board that has been. Um, 
what should we say, uh, butchered by yours truly with the purposes of demonstration. What I'm going to do here is try to fix its problems. Let's see. So I have some nice third hands and, and different things for holding stuff still, but I'm going to use this. And the first thing is the solder bridge where huge amount of solder was put in so much that it bridged across here to here. Mm -hmm. I can use a solder wick and remove excess solder. Heat the wick and the work and let the wick mop up the excess solder. This is something we have to be careful because you're using a lot of heat and you can uh, destroy the circuit board or damage components with the heat. That's one way to clean things up so I can get rid of that solder bridge. Another tool that we electronics types use is a solder sucker. This one is uh, a standard one, the uh, solder pult, and this one here is basically a miniature hand-operated vacuum where there is a plunger down inside the tube. There's the plunger with a seal. And this guy has a tip where the tip of the plunger, you can just see the tip there. When I fire the butt, press the button, it draws back quickly, producing a local vacuum right at the tip so that I can this is fun. Let's see if you guys can see this. There's the solder pult. Oh. There's the solder I want to remove. Melt the solder. Fire the solder pult. And you can notice here that there's a lot less solder. I didn't get it all in that shot because I didn't wait long enough for it all to be melted. So I re recock the solder pulp, melt, make sure all the solder is melted, boom. And that's the other way that you will want, you can, uh, a common way to remove excess solder from the work. Now that the excess solder is gone, I can re-solder it. But the other reason that you remove the excess solder is that solder has been used once that solder is now uh, potentially contaminated because it's been heated up and heated up again when I tried removal. And it may not be as good a quality a solder anymore. But uh, for interest, I'm not going to chase it all off. I'm just going to fix these. But I think you guys have the idea. Heat solder on the tip, apply it to the work, and put the visor back on. I can see what the heck I'm doing. Tip. And again, trying to form that tent of solder around on the pad and up onto the lead. This next guy here has a literal hole where the solder didn't get all the way around. I'm going to reheat it and fill the work piece. Uh, again, I'm heating the pad and the work and then applying enough solder to get a full connection. This one had no solder at all on the... There's no solder at all actually on the lead here. So wet the tip, apply it to both the lead and the pad. Next one, apply it to heating both of them and then, notice I'm not applying the solder to the iron. I'm applying the solder to the work. All right? Yeah. This is now a reworked piece. I have re-gone through. I can inspect the joints and say, okay, that's better. This might actually work now. But that's an example of reworking and you should see as the light reflects that I've got a nice tent 
all the way around each of the leads. Any questions or comments on the reworking process that you saw here? That's With regard good, to putting that's a good some, lesson. Yeah. Now, some, it should be remarked. Rework, this comes from years back working for Hewlett Packard when I was a line tech back in the 80s. Rework makes rework. You don't want to rework as a habit because your rework may cause new solder bridges. It may cause a component that was heated during the initial soldering to fail during your rework. So, yes, you can do it, but don't figure that that's a regular part of your Sorry, there. You don't want the rework to be a habit. It's a, odd oh, doggone it, there was one I didn't get right, I'll go back and fix it. But in general, you want to get it right the first time because soldering is not something you can keep doing. Dave? Yes? I've got one question. With the demise of fries, I don't have any local suppliers for anything electronic. That's right. Neither do I. Jameco, J-A-M-E-C-O, or Digikey, D-I-G-I-K-E-Y. Now, I see somebody, Seth here, is um, saying Jameco is in San Carlos, which is cool. I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to go over there sometime. But it turns out that Jameco, Digikey, um, and our friends over at... Um, Starts with an M, and I'm having a senior moment here. Mouser, Mouser Electronics. And then going up scale to the more commercial but still usable Newark Electronics and Allied Electronics. They all have excellent online catalogs. They have decent prices and quick delivery. And so those are all um, there. Uh, Seth is kindly uh, putting them up there, the names of the companies. Um, the, all the components that you see on this, ouch, oh, oh, those leads are sharp. <laughs> all these components came from a mix of Jameco, Mouser, Digikey. Uh, they offer price breaks at quantities down to 10 pieces. And they happily will sell you small quantities. So uh, it is the new way of life. Uh, the local electronic scrounge place, They've been destroyed. Yeah. Oh, Seth notices yeah, no. a twenty-five dollar minimum at Jameco. Uh, I've well, not had trouble making that minimum though. You know, sometimes when you can't wait for the delivery, you can use a toothpick to apply a very tiny amount of paste uh, flux. Yep. And also, uh, stranded copper wire as a substitute for the braid to remove excess solder. Nice. Yep. Um, the braids actually have, uh, the, the professional braids actually have a tiny amount of flux uh, put on them. And so they are a way to, um, that, makes, that makes it a little easier. But yes, stranded copper wire would work, uh, particularly if it's braided loosely so there are voids for the solder to flow into. Um, My newest soldering iron actually came with a, a sort of a plunger type uh, solder remover. Yep. The problem is, is, is I don't have five hands. Yep. Yep. You've got to hold the piece still. You've got to heat it and you've got to have the um, <laughs> solder sucker in, in action also. And so a third hand tool is your friend again, uh, Ken. Well, I've got third hand tools, but but they never seem to 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 work quite the way I should uh, they should, which is maybe a se special session for you and I. You bet. Now, mind you, you can sit there and blow some coin, and you know, not buy that next locomotive, but buy yourself a bigger, heavier third hand that gives you more options. This is. Uh, yeah. This this is a, a quad hand product purchased online, but uh, yeah, sometimes a bigger third hand. Also, if you are in the uh, 
bear with me, unenviable position of having to do a lot of big circuit board work. This is uh, our friends from Panavice. Yeah, which I have one, so. Right, one of these guys can accommodate all different sizes of circuit board and then present, and then you can hold the circuit board solid at whatever angle lets yeah. you be able to do the work um, I, safely and easily. Yes, sir. My problem is is that I really only need to do this once every three months or so. Yeah. I, you know, it's, it's not a constant thing for me. And uh, it, certainly I, it, when I was in, in all the years I spent in IT, it was with data, never with the hardware. Oh, you software people. <laughs> okay. Also, also uh, keep in mind simple solutions if you're only doing it once in a while. Uh, I often use BlueTack to hold things down, either hold a board down or hold two wires, you know, hold two wires close together or uh, hold a capacitor in place, uh, tape, and then, uh, and then there's these little, just doing wire to wire. I don't know if this comes across. Yeah. yeah. Just doing wire to wire soldering. It has a little V slots and you can make that with a, with a razor saw. Uh, and the, the two wires will be, you know, will be held in. Fran? In place. Yes. I understand you're the expert on, on repairing these. Um, I, I tell you, I did it many, many times. I don't know if I can get this, that size battery. I mean, you probably can. It's a sub C cell. Um, I mean, I'm willing to try if, if you really, if you don't want to give it up, you know. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, if you get it to me uh, and we can get the batteries. Well, I've got the batteries. Now I just need to get make sure that the, that the whole thing like the bulb went and, and everything else yeah i don't I'm, I'm not never, sure I, the I, charger I never, works either well i can't do anything about the charger uh and i don't have the bulbs but uh just packing new batteries in it uh is just a it's just you know space management yeah I, i'll try that i've got the batteries now but first you know, it just, I, this is a diversion, but, but the, the thing is that this thing is the most handy thing in soldering because I don't have to, to drag the wires and anything around on the layout. Yep. If you've, got, if you've got light work to do and only a few joints to do, that's a very nice solution. Um, you're, you're fixed with the, just the one tip you have. But uh, I'd like to... Uh, First of all, I think, was it James, you were asking about what the other side of the circuit board looked like? I think it was James. Anyway, so this one is a uh, what's uh, Chubb's S-Mini, which allows you to have these things around the layout, and then you can drive. Uh, this one has 24 inputs and 48 outputs, and I've got it rigged so I can run drive my... Uh, tortoise switch machines and drive my trackside signals. And uh, I just have to do a little bit of soldering to get all these parts in here. Um, another thing about soldering wires, of course, is simply twisting them together and then having a nice, tight, tightly twisted together thing here will be uh, solder that together. It's mechanically well held together and doesn't depend on the solder to hold it together. Our gentlemen, are we ready for me to do a solder together, a DCC decoder and uh, lights and all that stuff? Yeah. We game for go that? For, go for it. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Well, I went I went for it, but it was all sold out by the time I got there, Phil. Yeah. <laughs> I came back just in time. I've been waiting for this. I've been waiting for this, he cries. All right. So I'm going to start and uh, just roll through this. I'll sort of talk along as I do it. First of all, we have to get power off the track, right? And here we have an old school. Actually, this is sort of interesting. This is a old, old um, model of mine that I completely set up for DC operation with some D LED headlights, and I ripped them all out of there. And now I'm going to set it up for DCC. Step one, power off the rail. Okay, and here we have, again, the situation of 
getting a solder connection, in this case, to plated steel. It had some solder on here. I cleaned it off. So I'm going to put some fresh solder there. Wet it on the tip, apply it to the work. I want a little area of fresh solder. I have a wire that has been pre-tinned, as we discussed, and I'm going to apply that to the piece. And let's see if I can do this without burning my finger and creating a bunch of laughter over the channel. Now here I am doing, using solder as glue. The only reason I'm getting away with it is it's low stress and I've got a large contact area. Right now you'll see that there's a shiny, nice shiny solder there. This wire is a uh, test lead wire, extremely flexible with a rubber coating. So I can get away with using this wire here, even though the truck is moving around. Now, can we see the next one? Yes, there it is. All right. The wire is shaped, by the way, so that it minimizes the stress on the solder joint. Okay, next one. Fresh solder. Fresh solder on the work. Now I'm going to heat the work, both pieces, by lining it up. And try to hold it very still while that solder cools. Okay, connection one made. Next, the next set of connections is done here. Now this is a particular uh, this is just a, a particular way to do the, the job. There are many ways to skin this cat. But here what I have is a little piece of circuit board cut to just fit inside the shell of from side to side. It has been soldered by, here's the clip on the top of the motor. I put fresh, so, I solder, I fluxed it and put a bunch of solder there. Then separately I soldered these pads, then clip, held the two together firmly and used heated the, uh, heated the bottom of the clip such that these six pads are now soldered solid to the clip. This of course means I have a point to connect electricity to the top of the motor contact. Down here, solder fluxed pre-tinned the wire, wire was actually pre, comes pre-tinned, and soldered it to here, and then I come up, and now I have the bottom contact of the motor. But what I'm doing is, I'm going to be cute here, I'm going to bring that wire up through a hole in the circuit board. And here what we have is an example of soldering a wire into the circuit board. Bring her down. Get the tweezers, this is the wrong tool. Come on, come on. Bad word, bad word. Getting, getting wires and model railroad stuff is always a pain in the face. <laughs> okay, so it's up in there, it's filling the hole, so I can, again, wet the tip, apply it to the work, bingo, all right? So that wire now is the bottom contact for the motor. Notice these two pins here. The wires that I soldered to the tab sticking up off the trucks are going to these tiny pin connectors. I have already crimped the connector around the body of the wire for strength and I have crimped it around the wire itself but I do not trust that connection so guess what we're going to solder make a solder connection within these pin connectors and again we have that problem of will you please hold still you blankety blank piece of wire or connector or whatever it is I'm going to use a hemostat to hold the work still. Okay, get the hemostat here. 
and get this out of the way. And now here is where delicacy and fine solder is a necessity, is I want to solder the wire where it's crimped in this little part here, but the connector spring is right here. Let me show it on this one here where it's more visible. That connector is going to slide, the pin is going to slide into here, but I don't want to fill this with solder. I only want to solder right here. So I'm going to, in this case, I can't really heat the wire, but I'm going to heat the connector that surrounds the wire. And just a touch of solder and then inspect the work. And this is practice, gentlemen. There's, there's nothing here but practice, but you can probably see shiny silver here, but it isn't here. It didn't flow up into there. And it mostly was fresh, clean solder, a pre-tinned wire, because I pre-tinned the wire, this wire, before I crimped it in there. So it was ready to receive the solder. I'm going to do the same stunt again on the other one. I'll turn it right side up, crimp it, I'm uh, holding it here. All right, so I think you can see what I'm doing here, sort of. You need a microscope sometimes. I'm going to fire up my visor so I can see what I'm doing. Whoop. Now, on this one, it didn't go quite as well. I could see on that one that some solder did flow right in here. The question is, did it flow in so far that the connector is useless? Let's see. Nope. I got away with it. It's able to slide in. And so now... I have a good point to connect the electricity from the track to the point there where I'm going to connect up my DCC. But now there's another thing we have to do here. We have to get electricity off the other rail. In this case, on a, a fine vintage locomotive like this from Athern, that electricity is picked up on the frame. And so here we go again. We have a crimped terminal. I have a pre-tinned wire and I crimped it, crimped it on. There you see it. This one's a little easier to solder. Iron. Pre and a little solder on the iron and the uh, this is not the best work surface. Okay, here we go. You guys can see it. Fresh solder to help the heat get to the work. Apply the solder. And there's that, where I now have a reliable electrical connection from the that lug to the wire to get a reliable electrical connection to the frame. I look in my parts box for the screw that's hiding somewhere in here. Ah, there we go. So here we have a frame. Let me check my orientation of my pieces here. There. Okay, I'm going to come off this side. And lo and behold, we have a 256 screw going into a tapped 256 hole. And this again is to get the track voltage off the frame of the locomotive and I need that and here's another wire right and this is now you know depending on your particular locomotive that you're powering heaven knows where the uh, oh look the screwdriver is magnetized um, okay I'm gonna use some foul language here shucky darn heck fire um, all right, so here's my next cheat is a 
holder for small screws so the Verschluggener thing will stay under control as I get this thing installed. Come on. What I'm headed for here is to get electricity up to the top of that motor and that little circuit board. There she goes. Now, there's a solid connection to the frame, which is picking up electricity off the uh, that side of the locomotive. Now we get this in. I mm. wonder if Atherin is still selling new plastic mounts. I know that people use glue and stuff, but I like to pull my motors and overhaul them from time to time. So now, here we go. We have a motor with this interconnect board on top. I now have the electricity from one side of the track connected to the board. And now this wire, the, okay, we come off the frame there. I'm bringing this wire up. I'm not saying, by the way, this is right for you. It's just simply a way to skin this cat of getting the power. Now, again, I just took that wire, which I had pre-cut to length and shaped, blah, blah, and I come up into the circuit board again. Um, resetter. Say, Oh, thank you, sir. Ah, all right. So there's the wire right here. And um, clean the tip. Remember, old solder on the tip is contaminated because it's been cooking. Come in, heat the work. All right, so now that wire is soldered into the circuit board. Now what we now have is we have the top motor brush the bottom motor brush, the rail on the one side, and the rail on the other side, which means we can now connect the harness for the DCC decoder to these points. Per the standard, the red wire on the DCC is the right rail if memory serves and lo and behold i didn't cut these wires down they're sticking up enough that i can take that wrap of red wire which is the right hand rail okay where's the front okay there's the front this is the right hand rail over here now here i'm going to do something that ken talked about i'm going to go right on to, in this case, the pads. This guy here. And I have to clean the tip. Wet the tip. Say a prayer. Could you set your camera a bit? You're, uh, you're oh, not... It slipped away again. There. That better? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I'm... I'm focusing on the work here, and so I, I, the, the other screen where I can see it, what you guys are seeing is over my shoulder here. And I need a little bit more solder. Okay. Now, it failed. In this case, I heated the wire, but I didn't heat the pad that it needed to go onto, and the joint failed. So I'll try it again there that worked now on the other side i've got i'll depend on that holding the wire still clean the tip that needs to be a, a fetish that you have as you're constantly cleaning that tip to get that old junky solder off of there i don't usually like to do this but what I've done here is I've got the solder 
the wire here is soldered to there. I don't like this. I want to, I'm going to put some more solder at that point because I don't feel confident that it's really going to hold steady. So I'm going to clean the tip. I'll look again. There. Okay, I've got a nice connection for the red wire. The black wire is, of course, the other rail. And the other rail is coming off of the frame and over to here. I'm going to use my round nose pliers in this case and make a nice loop off this. Remember, I tinned, I pre tinned this wire on the harness too, so it would stay formed nicely for me. Clean the tip, add some solder. Okay, can you guys see that? My finger's not in the way. Yep, sure can. Okay, I didn't get enough solder on the iron. Now here's where that uh, number of hands problem comes in, but I'm trying to hold the wire with some other fingers and get a nice tent. Remember we talked about the tent. You can see, and, and there's, a, there's a dividing line somewhere between a big fat blob and a tent. But I've got shiny, shiny metal where that wire is now off the frame there. Now, motor brushes, right? Now, the top of the motor is connected through those traces. And what I'm going to do here is I'm simply going to drop the orange wire right into one of these traces. Clean the tip. Pick up a little fresh solder. In this case, I'm going to have to heat this and drop it in there. All right, that's now connected to the top brush of the motor. Okay, now remember this wire coming up here is connected to the bottom clip and thus the bottom brush. So I'm going to form another loop. And, and I know here I'm not talking specifically about soldering, but I'm just showing you the work as I progress. So here's the loop. Because of the, the space I'm working in and everything else, I'm going to wet the tip and use that solder. All right. So now my decoder is connected to the top motor brush, the bottom motor brush, and the rail. Now the reason I use these pin connectors is if I have to, if I'm in a mood to tear this truck apart to clean it, lubricate it, do some work on the, the wheels or whatever, I can just pull this. Now some people go the other way and they wire over and they use push a spade lug. They push a spade lug down onto the tab. That works just as well. Uh, this I just got a habit of doing it this way. No, there's no virtue, particular virtue. Now, let's have some fun. I don't know how many DCC folks are here today, but we have blue is the plus 12. The white will be pulled down to ground when we say turn on the forward direction headlight. The yellow is pulled down to ground when we want to have the rear direction headlight lit. Now, here we have my headlights. These are warm white LED headlights, two millimeter tower headlights. It so happens these two millimeter towers are happily a slip fit into the headlight housings on this SD40 T2 locomotive. Now I'm going to have to do some cutting of plastic, I think, out of the inside the shell for this, this top one here. 
but this is what I'm going to be installing in the shell. Uh, I'm going to wire way out in the open though so that I can cut the lead short when I go to do uh, a clean job. Oh, speaking of clean jobs, this guy here, not today, not right now, but I will heat shrink these guys to minimize the chance of touching something like the, the flywheel and shorting out in some stupid way. But for the moment, we'll leave them bare. Okay, now, wiring up the LEDs. The first thing is excessive heat will destroy these. And so here comes our friend, the aluminum heat sinks. This is what you want to do before you solder a light emitting diode or a transistor or other semiconductor device. You want to keep the soldering heat off the part. So in this case, I can do this. This is pretty easy to do. Recenter. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Keep, keep reminding me. Here we have a part that is protected from the heat of soldering. I'm going to move these guys in here and work on them, move the locomotive out of the way. Now, you may remember, we have to have a resistor in series with each light emitting diode. You can't put two of them on one resistor. You have to have one resistor per. And what you see here is a collection of 1000 ohm resistors, one, two, three, four, five, going to a common terminal out here at the end. I'm going to connect the blue wire to this. That blue wire will provide plus 12 volts to all the other pins. Now, uh, to be able to do that soldering, I need to have the silly thing held steady. And of course, here's where a third hand tool is your friend. But for the purposes of this tutorial, here is the third hand. And voila, the thing is now had held quiet. And so now I have a connection collection of, what am I going to call it here? A collection of 1000 ohm resistors that I want to connect to our LEDs. And so here we go. I just took a tinned fine wire. Actually, what it is, it's a leftover piece of decoder, decoder hookup wire. And I'm going to connect it here. And this is where, again, doing the action of providing more mechanical, better mechanical connection by turning that wire into a loop. OK, checking my camera. All right. Tin the tip, heat the work, apply the solder. One down. Were you guys able to see that very well? Was that was that reasonably visible? Yeah. All right. Now bear with me here. I will toss on the other wires here. Okay, tin wire. Use my, again, a tweezers, a fine tweezers could also work here. Oh, that's interesting. This one isn't tinned. All right, we'll have to tin it. So let's tin a small wire. Get this out of the way. That's right, I left this one on tin so I could show you gentlemen tinning, tinning this wire. Clean the tip of the iron. The wire in the field of view, yes. Wet the tip. And then I just run down the wire. And it is tinned. Again, using rosin core solder. No need to on fresh clean wire like this, no need to use rosin paste flux or anything like that. If you had old wire and it was green, you should throw it away. 
get you might want to get that yeah get that away from your uh... let him in diodes yeah oh come on I would never destroy them accidentally Ken that never happens <laughs> Again, use your visor or make sure you've got an eyeball that you can see that you're successfully tinning the thing and that you're not just getting the wire is being pushed around but not actually taking up any solder. Great, I just got solder on my work light. <laughs> okay, so that was the first wire. I need four LEDs for two headlights front, two headlights rear. So I am now making the second loop here. And the loops are a little big for what I'm doing here. So I'm going to work the loop tighter and smaller so that it won't short out between these leads. Okay. And I just knocked it loose. You can laugh now. Now this is again where, okay, you can say, well, maybe it'll stay still. Or maybe you'll use your third hand tool and hold it still. In this case, blue tape, again, is now holding the work so it cannot move while I solder it. That's going to mean I'm going to get a better quality joint out of this this thing even when working in this really small space. Again, a great big soldering iron tip is going to be a disaster. This is where I could actually take this tip off and go to one of those really fine tips that I have so it's easier to get in there and make the connection. So uh, this is where taking the time to switch over. Now, maybe what you have is a, uh, a fine two different soldering irons, one with a large tip and one with a small tip. That works. Maybe you don't have the fancy round nose pliers, and instead you get your fine tweezers and bend up your work, bend up your wire into that fine, fine loop that you need to get on to the next terminal. Yeah, sure. David, David the other thing I find is if you use one of those really tiny Julia screwdrivers, you can just kind of wrap it around just that to get that loop. Exactly. That's And, and in this case, it's whatever works for your hands and your eye bones and, and your manual dexterity. It may be that all you can do is have a, a, a half of a half of a loop, which is, um, but it's whatever you can do, again, to make sure that it isn't going to move once the, uh, once you pull away with the soldering iron and the sirens go, the solder is going to solidify. That's the, that's the main thing is no movement. Okay. Again, I'm using the blue tape. I use my visor, inspect it, make sure it's not touching on either side, clean tip, wet tip. Obstruction. Apply to work. Yes, sir. Obstruction. <laughs> Your camera. Ah, duh. Sorry, I bumped it with my visor and it moved in. Okay, so I, using my visor, I look here and I see that it's not touching here. It's not touching there. Okay, three down, one to go. Thank you for your patience, gentlemen, as I do this. Where did the fourth wire go? Oh, my goodness. Huh. Um, hello. Ah, there it is. Phil, why did you move that wire on me? See, I find all, it's all deliberate to make it take longer. Yeah, it's all, uh, I'm just doing this, I, I, you know, blame it on Phil, I find, gentlemen, is a, a great way to resolve any modeling difficulties. Is that doggone Ed Holm? He messed me up again. Now, you could make your life a little bit easier by getting 
if you get one of these resistor networks, as they're called, is to get a resistor network with more pins than you need, cut away every other pin to give you more room to work. That would be, uh, I'm, I'm saying this now in hindsight as I look at it as I'm struggling with this, this guy here. But in some locomotives, this may be all the space you have. And so, you know, you, you're going to have to do that. Okay, where's my uh, third hand? Okay, we're just about done with this phase and can actually start doing the LEDs. Okay. Okay, fresh solder. Everybody have a, can see? Fresh solder, apply it to the work, get away. Nice, bright, shiny. Now we can connect up the 12 volt supply, the blue wire from the detector. And again, I have pre-tinned the wires. I've pre-tinned the wire, and I'm gonna put it on the common terminal. So once again, now because the there's an unused terminal on this guy, right? Because I had five pins that are five resistors, I'm actually going to make my life a little easier. I've just removed the lead for the fifth resistor because I don't need it for this this particular job. So now I can bring in the blue wire. Right? Loop formed, wire in place, and it's going to hold still because it's tied into the rest of the detect the uh, decoder wiring. Wet the tip, clean the tip, wet the tip, and solder. So now what I have is I have four wires that are 12 volts from the decoder available to be connected to the light emitting diodes. Now, the light emitting diodes, bring them up here, you have a long lead and a short lead. If you look inside the guts of the light emitting diode, there's the part, I think sometimes called the anvil, which is um, on the side, I'm laying the probe over here, and that is what goes to the minus. If like, if you clip the lead short and you couldn't tell which one is the long lead anymore, look for the lead that's connected to the anvil. That's the one you connect your minus to. The small lead inside goes to the positive. Now, the positive is the purple wire that comes off our resistor. The long lead on this guy is going to go to the positive. But now I have two light emitting diodes, right? So once again, I'm going to form a loop here in this plus 12 volt line coming off the through the resistor, right? It's been limited by the current. And I go, okay, long lead plus. And now here's where I could solder this right in here. And it would be fine because I have that heat sink there. I have that heat sink there to protect the, come here. I have the heat sink there to protect it, but because I'm not installing it in the locomotive today, I'm just showing you gentlemen soldering, I'm gonna solder it out here. But the heat sink is there to show you that you need to protect the thing. Wet the tip, apply solder to the work, and I need another third hand tool here. You saw the wire explode away from me. Okay, cutie pie, get over here. All right, wire is held still. Clean the tip, fresh solder, apply it to the work. Okay, there's one. 
And again, the I didn't need a heat sink on the other one. I only needed it on the one I was soldering, unless you're doing like you're going to go do one and go do the other. In this case, I'm going to just do one after the other here and get these four done. Fortunately, the um, light emitting diodes are not too sensitive for static electricity. Um, that is a separate topic. Uh, on the wiring I'm going to do on the Chubb, Big Chubb circuit board that you saw, one of the components is sensitive to static electricity. And so you would have to be careful to not zap it and destroy an expensive part. Okay, here you go. Heat sink on the part and the part into the wire. Held still. Again, I could be soldering the wire right here because the heat sink is going to protect the part, but I'm soldering out here because I'm going to have to undo this when I go to actually put this silly thing. The other thing you need to remember to do is to add on your shrink wrap. I always forget. Well, Phil, that I think is an optional thing depending on how you're installing the, the light emitting diode. Um, but it's certainly if you're worried about shorting out because of tight space and such, then shrink wrap is the way to go. The uh, And doing it before you actually stick it in the model <laughs> may be a good idea because heating the shrink wrap inside a delicate model with fine plastic parts may lead to tears as you melt one part or another of the locomotive. But yeah, heat shrink and uh, I don't know, I use a heat gun for my heat shrink. Some people use matches. Uh, I don't don't like that myself because it's easy to go from shrinking to burning. But that's a matter of mm, personal preference and, and what you have available. A heat shrink gun does cost some money. And we're notorious about spending money on buying a new locomotive rather than tools. But then again, OK, so it's tied down again the long the long lead where's the uh, there it is the long lead apply to the work apply some solder last one getting close to actually making this work by the way the decoder is already programmed and is sitting over there ready to be plugged into this mess I'm not plugging the decoder in while I do this work because it's just why why subject it to the abuse of being near connections and soldering irons and everything else all right everything's held still getting closer here wipe the tip clean fresh solder apply it to the work and solder and again I'm noticing as I look at this it's bright and shiny that's what we want to see there is it's bright and shiny it doesn't show up I'm afraid real well for you guys I'm exceeding the limits of what I have in terms of a camera now the next step is to connect the front headlight to the two LEDs that are going to be the front now what I'm going to do here is spread the leads apart on the LEDs. I'm going to make my loop again, and I'm simply going to stick the two LED leads through the same loop. You could, of course, wire them together with a separate wire and then connect that. This, way, you know, there's different ways you could do this. What I'm just going to do is, for the purposes of this demonstration, is try to get both leads through the loop and call it good. One, come on, there we go. Okay, now remember you have to have a resistor or a resistor for each lead, which is the purple wires, the plus 12, are each going through a resistor, the resistor that actually goes to the plus 12 supplied, but the other side can be driven connected together as I'm doing here. 
Wet the tip. Now, whoops. What am I forgetting, gentlemen? Heat sink. And heat sink. It's always fun doing a clinic because you're in a hurry, you're trying to show people stuff, and so you forget things. There. Now it's heat sank, heat sunk, heat sinked. And of course, I disturbed it and the wire came out there. Okay, both wires are in the loop. Both wires have a heat sink. Both leads, I beg your pardon, both leads to the, the LEDs and solder. All right. So now that is my front headlight pair, which have been connected to the plus 12 supply with the two leads and connected to the front headlight output of the decoder. Now we will throw together the other two for the rear headlight. Heat sink. Heat sink. And here is the yellow wire, which is the drive for the rear headlight. I'm going to form a slightly larger loop by going a little further down on the round nose pliers to get a, a little bit bigger loop. All right. Now I'll try to get the LED lead somewhere in the same neighborhood. loop over them. There we go. I think that's in the field of view of the camera. Now, clean the tip, apply the tip to the work, let the solder flow to the work, and inspect the finished joint, which is bright and shiny. And now we have, ladies and gentlemen, I'll let you decide who of you is a lady and which of you is a gentleman, and then the rest of you, which are just model railroaders. And here we have a completed soldered installation, minus the tears and frustration of actually getting the LEDs to sit properly where they need to sit inside the model. The resistor array can simply be glued in somewhere out of the way inside the shell. Now, if you want to, um, at this point, I will... Um, if you guys like, I can actually throw the decoder in this thing and put it, put DCC power to it and watch it burst into flames. Uh, those who, but I think at this point what I should do is I should pause for more questions and comments of which you gentlemen have had some excellent comments like Phil mentioning heat shrink tubing over this connection here to keep things from shorting out, for example. Have I got comments, suggestions, jokes before I try to power this thing up? Well, um, the current on those, uh, those LEDs is approximately what? 10 milliamps. And what I, I kind of doesn't register with me is uh, having separate 1K or even two, I usually use 2K resistors and yep. um, can you use one 2k resistor on the positive and just wire all the leds to them because they're not all on at the same time well unfortunately leds have a thing that they do that makes it a problem the led internal resistance if you will can vary as they move through their operating range and they're not identical units. So if we had one purple wire going to both LEDs, right? In other words, we did yeah, I know. this, right? And just had the purple wire. Mm -hmm. LEDs are active devices. Those are semiconductor devices. They're not like a resistor. If you had two resistors here in place, two, let's say they're 
5 ohm resistors. The current would come through the 1K resistor and then the current would shear neatly between the two 5 ohm resistors. LEDs don't act like that. One of them would turn on and start conducting and hog all the current and the other one might not light at all. Or the one could hog the current and burn out and the other one would then then take all the current and then it would burn out. It would depend on the voltages, currents, the resistor you had, but they don't share current equally. And this forces us to have one resistor for each light emitting diode. Now, you can buy light emitting diodes where the resistor is built in, and those would share, but a plain light emitting diode like this, one resistor per customer. That's just, unfortunately, the way that these particular devices work. Okay, as, as it happens, um, I only do very small locomotives and critters, and um, I only do a, a headlight and a backlight. Yeah. So um, I have been using one resistor, so I'm probably safe with that. You're, you're getting away with it, but in terms of reliability, it is best practice is one resistor per light emitting diode. Um, and but if you if you don't have the space and you're getting away with it, I tip my hat to you. Uh, I need for Phil, could you vamp for a few moments while I clear my bench and get ready to apply power to this nightmare? Sure, you will. Go ahead and unspotlight you. Thank you. The, uh, go ahead and throw it back to gallery. Any other any comments or uh, other uh, other takes on the uh, soldering on that multi resistor? Excuse me. In some occasions, you might be able to use just a piece of paper or cardboard to separate the individual resistors while you were soldering. Yep. Anything to uh, anything just to make that that's give you Can't that maintain space. your gap. Yep. Yeah, tucking something down in there. Paper is I think a paper is an excellent choice. It's very thin, but it it will pr certainly prevent things from getting tangling with each other. I've got a, um, I think I've, I've showed this, I think on the last, the first part of, uh, of, uh, of David's demo. Um, a year ago, I had zero chance of installing a decoder uh, because my, uh, my tremor was, was getting worse. Uh, this, heavy metal base, a cradle for the soldering gun, and, and it, it tips. So put this down on my bench. My trimmer is not strong enough to move it, and I can come down and, and accurately hit my solder pads or my wires or whatever. Um, again, I had totally given up on, on soldering because you, you just make a mess and, and, and destroy things. But um, uh, Phil turned me, Phil suggested a design something like this and uh, and I just printed it out. You can make it with wood blocks if you want. It's also it can be you can switch soldering guns on uh, irons on it with just a ziploc tie. Uh, has blue tack, blue you know blue putty tack down there which helps keep everything steady. That's a great, great thing for if you got shaky hands. So, by the way, coming back to the multiple LEDs, what you typically don't want to do is wire multiple LEDs in parallel. But if you wire them in series, then they actually all get the same current. And in fact, if you look at the resistor calculators, they'll all ask number of LEDs in series. So, if you're going to do you know, two LEDs, 
you can put two LEDs in series with a thousand ohm resistor and you'll lose about, you know, some percentage of the brightness then. Because what's happening is you're getting the two LEDs resistance in series with the resistor resistance. The, the other problem, by the way, with wiring them in parallel is at some point you resist, you get to a power level where the resistors will get hot. Um, so basically, because if you've got, if you've got, remember, remember that the current, that the resistance is half if you put them in parallel. So if you put four LEDs in parallel, their resistance is a quarter of what they had, which means now the major the resistance on the resistor is carrying most of the current and therefore most of the power. And even though those resistors are generally rated at a quarter of a watt, um, they get really pretty warm at an eighth of a watt or even less. So that's something to think about. Series makes more sense than parallel with LEDs. Is there a requirement for a for a heat sink? You know those clips. Should it be aluminum? Does it matter? I haven't, but I'm not as fastidious as David is. <laughs> no, I, I just I haven't I haven't done it. I never thought about it being an issue, but um, I just muted you, David, because you were you need to unmute. Well, for someone like me who likes to send puffs of smoke often, I think heat sinks are wonderful. <laughs> yeah, you you want aluminum or copper. A copper alligator clip. Copper is a very good conductor of heat. So copper alligator clips are, if you've got those, they're great. If you don't have anything, then the aluminum ones are nice. I got a little set of aluminum ones because they had different angles and they were made just for the job uh, of grabbing a lead for, um, you know, on a, an active device. Okay, I'm powering up my... Yeah, those, those uh, aluminum ones, I just ordered them from my Amazon. They're only $5.95. So you're the one who took all their stock, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Said there's only one left. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see here. Is the iPad image showing the uh, my test track here now? It is, and it's up spotlighted so everybody can see it. Okay. Now, this is going to be a, a, a real temptation to the electronics, um, a real temptation to men to malfunction spectacularly. Here is a, a NCE D13J. It's been programmed with the locomotive, uh, the, the DNRG locomotive is supposed to go into 5378. Okay, so there it is. It's connected up. Okay, I'm now going to see if I can turn the LEDs so they're pointing towards the iPad. Come on. I may have to. <laughs> okay, hang on. Tape. You guys are going to laugh so hard if this all goes up in a puff of smoke, but that's okay. It's all part of the, the uh, tutorial experience, right? Or the clinic experience. Remember the yellow wire. We're excited. Huh? We're all excited. Yeah, you're all excited. Yeah, I'm just going to. I, I just know from years of experience, decades of experience as an electronics technician and high-tech worker that there's no better way to make stuff malfunction than try to demonstrate it. Okay, so power on. There was a flash, which usually the lights flash when you first bring stuff up. Okay, here comes my ProCab. Select loco. Five, three, seven, eight. Watch as your board doesn't hit the track rail. Seven, eight. Thank you. Enter. Okay. 
headlight. And I have nothing. <laughs> Five, three, seven, eight. Okay, let me switch back to the Yeah, I have a little test station here with a uh, decoder tester from NCE connected up to drive a motor. And I have a switch here. Oh, you know, if I apply power to the main line on the test track, I bet I'll get a much better response from decoder 5378. Main. Main, reverse, okay, what am I doing wrong? I'm trying to demonstrate this to people, that's what I'm doing wrong. Program track, main track, set to main. Okay. All right, it's obviously I'll try a quick. Uh. Uh. Yeah, now we're now of course what we're doing is we're moving into the the realm of DCC and um, And DCC has its own things completely separate from, from soldering, right? Did you remember to throw the virgin in the volcano? Yeah. This is where, you know, having a ramp made or making sure that, it, you know, you sure the power is connected to the track, right? Yeah, I have an idiot light on here. It's uh, indicating okay. I'm delivering. I moved the uh, decoder back onto the test bed. Yep. And... Two, three, four. Enter. All right, it sees the decoder. It's um, okay. I'm going to have to. Um, it, it's obviously going to um, sit here and pee in my shoes as long as I'm trying to show it to you. As soon as I stop dem trying to demonstrate, it'll start working. But the point was this. Today, what I hoped is, is I gave you gentlemen an idea about soldering for model railroading, both circuit boards and doing soldering onto just little wires and little bitty stuff. And so um, I'm going to uh, declare victory and run away, even though it, it is not in the mood to work here, but it's probably more like I've got something programmed wrong in the decoder or something stupid like that. Um, any other questions or comments? I, I know we had some real good thoughts. Phil, thank you for reminding me about the series for the gentleman that has the little locomotives. You can indeed go from the plus 12 to the plus of one LED, then wire from the minus of the LED to the plus of the other LED, and then off to the decoder headlight drive you just have to choose a resistor with a slightly different value. You still want to limit the current to the typical 10 milliamps. So it might be that instead of a thousand ohm resistor, you would actually need like a 800 and, oh, 870 ohm resistor or something. Um, but you'll actually, Phil, you'll actually get the same brightness if you simply adjust the resistor to maintain the same current through those um, through those two or three or four or five LEDs. I could have and probably should have wired, now that you pointed out to me, I could have wired the two headlight LEDs in series and simplified my wiring. And uh, so thank you for pointing that out to me. That's my learning from this uh, from this tutorial. By the way, I'll throw this up in, as a link. This is the DigiKey one. Yeah. And so what you do is enter the voltage. And the th cool thing they have is 
the voltage varies depending upon the light frequency of the LED. So if you've got you know other frequencies than white, white typically you know, three volts is what people talk about with white because white is actually blue light with they have some phosphor something built into the plastic to make it more white. Uh, but what you can do is put in you know the supply voltage so 12 volts. If you want your forward voltage to be 2.5 and you want 10 milliamps, then it will calculate the resistor value for you. But Phil, the thing is, or and, I'm sorry, and if you have two LEDs, you simply double the forward yep. voltage. And actually there's another one I saw that actually has the capability to put two in, right? So if you put two LEDs in here on this one, you just put five volts there and then you get a seven. So you go from, you know, for a, regular single bulb this would recommend for 10 milliamps which it will last it rests 950 so you probably won't put a 1k in if you go to five which is two in series it's 700 so you'd probably put a 680 or a seven something in so right i'm actually going to redo the wiring on this thing to do that because what it means is i only have to have two resistors yep. um, in place of the, the the four resistors that I'm using in the rig you guys are seeing here. So that's my learning. Anybody else? Uh, thoughts, comments, or feedback in the way I perform this tutorial? I Here's think the tutorial was great, and my fear factor has been reduced by 17.375%. Excellent. <laughs> I, mean, I just, if the tutorial was great, I'm just going to have to sit down and practice. Yes, of course. Uh, it's just a matter of, of not doing it often enough that uh, I feel any confidence. But by, by the way, the one other little side, kind of, I, I find when I do the LEDs, if you take, like I said, if you take a screwdriver, and you take the wire and leave it about a half an inch long and just start wrapping it on the screwdriver. It's kind of a little concentric loop down. Then it slides right on the LED lead. And you've actually got, you know, a, you know, about maybe not a quarter of an inch, but three sixteenths of an inch of loops to solder on. And it makes it really easy to get a nice solder joint on those LEDs. And then you can just trim off the tail that's left, you know, from the original thing when you get done putting on and that. And the cool thing then is you don't want to ever trim them first. You always want to trim them after because otherwise it's too easy to forget which is which. Yeah. Yeah. You just wrap it into a spiral. You wrap yep. it in a spiral. Exactly. I, I have this little really tiny Julia screwdriver and I just grab it every time and wrap it around that. It's a question of how much space you have to work in. Now, Absolutely. I'm not even going to talk about the surface mount LEDs <clears throat> that, um, are one twentieth or one thirtieth the size of the LEDs you see here. That's a separate nightmare, and I don't care to get into it. Uh, this I figured this was you. Those of you who have stayed with us here today, I really appreciate your patience. Uh, this this went on for a long time, but uh, again, I just hope that it'll give you, uh, as as the one gentleman said, a, a bit more confidence in in doing this work, because it it ain't with practice with practice it ain't that hard and and some tools the right tools uh david thank you i i, I was fascinated watching all this i mean i've done this before and my i still remember my first uh decoder install i was talking to the guy back at displays hobbies and he said okay it should work and this little glow worm came out of the side of the engine <laughs> So yeah, this is a mystery kind of a route. Uh, do you have a good suggestion for um, resistor? Um, I'm trying to think, I know they're banded and everything else, but uh, a chart or something like that for resistors, do you just kind of poke around for it? Um, the, well, there, there are online color code charts that you can get. Um, Let's see, what's the thing? Um, bad boys RAS are, let's see, come on. I, You're I, trying to remember it. I was trying to remember that too. There's the, the little line about it. Violet goes willingly is the end of it. 
Is this like, uh, you know, res are? It tells you the numbers of the resistance it provides. Yeah. It's yeah. bad is zero. Boys is one. Bright boys rave over young girls, but Vito getting wed. But Violet wife. goes willingly is the one I remember, but yeah, yep. we all learned it back in politically <laughs> incorrect times. But that's a mnemonic that that I was taught low and many yeah. years ago. But yeah, online you can get some little charts that show the. Um, could you now, do me one favor and just put up the the, the rosin core solder that you're using? Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, let me mind you. <coughs> There's multiple good brands of, of solder. Uh, this one is, <clears throat> let's see. Yeah, this okay. Alpha metal. Could, no, I actually want the spec. Um, you said uh, WRMA? Yeah, mildly oh. activated rosin is the uh here okay that's that was what i was most interested yeah. in was now look sure. for wrma that is uh very good for hand soldering uh in the work the sort of work that we do this is 0 0.032 i don't think you should get anything bigger than that yeah. you can still get tin lead solder off of amazon or ebay and for our hand soldering work i think it is a little better than the non-lead bearing solders. But always wash your hands after soldering so you're not ingesting lead off your fingers. Okay, because I'm, I'm just looking here at uh, uh, 6040 tin lead solder wire with rosin for electric. Uh... Yep. What well, most of us are brain dead anyhow. Yeah, well, but you know you that just want to millimeter do, you don't want to kill off the uh, the few remaining brain cells we do have operating yeah you want to get but look for kester ursin e r s i n yeah well uh, the alpha metal i would not buy a no name solder frankly uh, okay you want to get one of the the regular mainline brands um because it's it's just the quality of the actual flux that's in there, the consistency of the flux ratio inside that that tiny hole down the middle of the solder where the flux is. Yeah. Good quality brands, that quality control is there. Well, so these are the brands on Amazon, and I, they're very interesting. No, no, I would not. <laughs> I just okay. Yeah, uh, I I I'm I'm about to. Uh reduce that do a search, do a search. um <laughs> what were those brands again kester k-e-s-t-e-r ursin e-r-s-i-n and alpha metals uh, yeah. there's uh, there's a couple of others um i could i could go where are they i mean i've still got old uh archer i would not use it frankly it's very old yeah you very can... old no 1980s no. don't uh give me a minute gentlemen i'll be right back so i just shared this is if you search for kester on amazon okay so what was that again it, this is searched on 6040 solder kester yeah and so then it gives you these and these are kind of the spools here which look like they're not very inexpensive but well it's just i need to replace this old archer that may be one of the reasons i'm having problems yeah it may very well be they've got these which are the smaller ones these are lead free mm -hmm. um, but anyway you can look through this this is you know an activated core 0 0.31 diameter rosin yeah. cord wire solder Okay. But you just well, have to look that, that's, Yeah. I'll Point throw three the... one is really small, isn't it? Is you I take it you want something smaller? Like I, right I think if you're doing it? those I think if you're doing the circuit boards, you really need something small. I mean I'm not sure you'd want to use the same wire for 
I, I think that's probably there's probably a need for two different wires, one for when you do track and one for when you do do electrical, electronic. Yeah. This is so this is Amazon's choice. Yeah. No, I I'm Yeah. Wait, this this is really Amazon's choice. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of the way Amazon is there. Yeah. Down, I, 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 okay, it hasn't killed me yet. Yeah. If you go down here, you can actually kind of see what the uh, I don't know why they call it steel. That's interesting. Yeah, it's the garbage <laughs> data. The, uh, yeah, it is. the thing is is that tin lead. Uh, I checked my stock. I'm I'm carrying Alpha Metals, Kester, and Urson. Urson SN sixty forty is wonderful stuff. Um, it's it's not easy to find. But the Ur the Urson actually has multiple tiny cores, and uh, really is good at wetting. But WRMA mildly activated rosin solder is rec highly recommended. Fine diameter, uh, 0.032 or finer. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would not use that old Radio Shack solder uh, for anything you really wanted to depend on. Mm -hmm. um, the commercial, the regular commercial name brand stuff, uh, the industrial, you know, that's that sold the electronics industry, um, is the stuff. Any, and, any and David, other? I think if if your uh, the solder gives the percentage like that sixty forty, yes. that's generally le uh, lead based solder as opposed yeah. to lead free. Well, see, but look specifically for SN. Um, uh, SN is one one term you'll see, but actually look to see that it says lead bearing. It's it's getting harder to find because of the the um, um, toxicity of the lead. But um, I just for hand soldering, I just um, I've used the lead free solder solders, and for this kind of work, it just is better behaved. Sixty forty. Um, Okay, I I want to go troubleshoot my DCC here. Why isn't it working? <laughs> Just on it. Plus, I need to. I, I tell you what, I think it's probably time to let David go troubleshoot his DCC and call it a a Saturday. If everybody's ready, or. David, this is just excellent. It was really brilliant. brilliant. It was a great, great morning. Thank you. David, thank you very much. My pleasure. And I can't that wait helps. for the next meet to find out what you found. <laughs> oh, it's going to be something incredibly stupid. You know that. It's something really dumb. It's, it's, I'll, it'll, it'll, as soon as I turn off this and go over to it, it'll go, oh, look, I forgot to plug it in or something dumb. Well, I, that sounds I like something smoke. my dad used to always say. It's got to be just some little simple problem. He'd say that even about brain surgery. Yeah. <laughs> I see smoke coming from the hills over there in Richmond where Bob lives, and I see smoke coming from Hayward where you live. Man, I'm surrounded. <laughs> so I think your brains are working overtime. Man. Oh, I don't even have one after all this. Guys, thank you. <laughs> Lunch time, guys. The opportunity to teach this tutorial, and uh, hopefully the recording works so it can be shared with others. That We want. are, we are yeah. still recording, and I will clean it up and put it up. My goal is to get both oh. these up today. So. I, I yeah. So, David, you're going to find out you have a pair of pliers sticking across the track somewhere. So. Something. <laughs> something. Yeah. Um, Phil, just to let you know, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go to Mar to up to the museum. I have two people here that if a breakthrough infection happened, it would kill them. So until, I understand. Until we, get my, until we all get our boosters and stuff, I'm tending to try to stay, stay, stay home as much as I can. Absolutely. Nothing personal. I'd love to go, but no, I'm not going to. Be well, all you guys. I'm bugging out of here. Have a good okay. one. Have a good one, everyone. We're going to call it a Thank week. You, David. Great show. Thank I got to say, here's just one picture for you guys. See, this is what I've been doing for this meet, you know? Oh, man. <laughs> ah, there you go. <laughs> He's a busy boy. The double throw, double throw, switch, crossover, soldering is ingrained in my mind, you know? Oh, yes. You're having fun. All right, guys. Bye -bye. Have a good one, everyone. Bye right. now. Bye-bye, guys. Yep. Yeah. Bye. Yeah.